For all its beauty and splendor, the wilderness can be a cruel teacher. Outdoor disasters, stories of triumph, tragedy, and the unwavering will to survive. They've ignited a spark within you, making you both laugh and cry while prompting questions like, why would anyone do that? Together, we've explored remote Taiwanese mountains, endured the scorching heat of Death Valley, braved the relentless South Pacific seas, stood atop Yosemite's towering granite formations, and ventured to many other corners of the globe, where stories of human spirit triumphing against all odds have shone brightly. We've also witnessed heart-wrenching tragedies, yet in the end, these narratives have provided valuable lessons on how to honor and respect the Earth's awesome power. Her seas, mountains, deserts, and forests are beautiful, but dangers are lurking if we are unprepared to honor Mother Nature and the power she wields. The following stories represent some of the best content this channel has to offer, demonstrating that regardless of the challenges we encounter, we possess the resilience to survive, the capacity to learn from our errors, and the necessity always to be well prepared as we explore the wilderness. Outdoor Disasters would like to thank you all for your unwavering support. It's impossible to convey just how much your viewership, likes, comments, feedback, and shares mean. Your belief in Outdoor Disasters has become the driving force behind the commitment to delivering the high quality content you expect. Whenever you see a new upload, you can rest assured that it will be a captivating experience immersing you briefly in a world that remains beyond the grasp of many of us. Please click the subscribe and like buttons. This is Outdoor Disasters Top 10 50K Sub Celebration. For Rick Magee, his Outback experience would truly be an unforgettable nightmare. Ricky McGee, at the time, a 35-year-old, had been offered work in a government department in Port Hedland, Western Australia. He accepted the job and set off on the long drive, which he had made multiple times before. Driving a 2001 Mitsubishi Challenger, he took the Buntine Highway, which for much of his journey was a desert track across the outback of the Northern Territory. Because he had a couple of days before starting his new job, he wanted to visit an old mate, so decided to take a detour and drive to Halls Creek, where his friend resided. He turned left off the Stewart Highway near Dunmara, about 300 miles south of Darwin, and hit the dirt of the Buchanan Highway heading towards Top Springs. By taking the shortcut, he was confident he'd make it to Halls Creek before dusk. The road was not much more than a goat track and had its fair share of potholes, but it saved a couple of hours not sticking to the highway. Hours later, he came across some stranded Aboriginal people. They flagged him over next to their broken down Kingswood. Not many vehicles travel the Buntine in January because it's mostly dirt and the road can get washed out in the wet season. He knew if he drove past them, they'd be waiting in the sun for a while. He pulled up a safe distance in front of the Kingswood and indicated for one of them to come and explain what they needed. All the doors of his car were locked and the windows wound up except for the front seat passenger side. He wanted to have his bases covered if they tried anything. There would be no opportunity to punch him if he hit the gas. He also had his machete. The stranded man explained they'd run out of fuel and needed a lift to Hall's Creek. He indicated for him to get in. He gave him a cold beer and they were off. About 20 minutes in, across the top edge of the western desert, he was out of beer. The passenger cracked another one and opened it for him. That was the only time I took my eyes off my drink for the entire trip, Ricky said. After 10 minutes, he began to feel groggy. His vision had warped. It wasn't as if this was the first time he'd ever had a few cans driving through nowhere, but it had never come to this. They were only a couple of hours away from Hall's Creek. He kept driving despite the feeling, but he couldn't shake the feeling of incredible lethargy. Meanwhile, his silent passenger sat back and cracked himself another can. He didn't seem concerned at all by the reckless swerving across the road. Ricky Meggie doesn't remember anything much after that. When Ricky opened his eyes, he was sitting in the front passenger seat of his car. What was going on? The car wasn't moving. When I raised my head, I could see it was parked on the side of a dirt highway, he said. He gets out of the car to have a look around. He heard some voices that were coming from behind some bushes. As he approached, 
The voices dropped. Groggily, he turned to walk back to the car and got in the driver's seat and was about to hit the gas when he saw a figure out of the corner of his eye. In a flash, the man jumped from the shadows and onto the footstools on the back of the car. He floors it down the dirt highway, trying to shake the figure off the rear, but he had a spider-like grip and didn't budge. Using a rock, he smashed the back window of Ricky's car vehicle to force his way in. The next thing Ricky knew they were fighting while bumping along the dirt highway at well over 60 miles per hour. Then they slammed into some bushes on the side of the road. Ricky got out gingerly and disoriented. He looks and sees the figure running off into the darkness. Hours later, Maggie is sitting on the side of the road, disoriented, trying to come to grips with what is happening, when he sees people rummaging through his car, looking for anything of value. Soon, a young Aboriginal man comes over with a bottle of booze, telling Ricky not to say anything. With nothing to lose, Ricky takes a swig and again passes out. When he regained consciousness, he was in a hole covered in black plastic with some rocks and dirt thrown on top. Something was spread over my face, sand. I wiggled my toes, no shoes. I struggled to move, felt my pockets for my lighter, nothing. Cigarettes gone, where was I? I had no clue. Something was pushing through the tarp, the sound of sniffing, dogs maybe. I wriggled and pushed myself up, forcing back the cover into daylight and heat. Now I was face to face with a pack of dingoes, ready to sit down to dinner, Ricky said. Only the attempts by four dingoes to claw him woke him up. In the middle of the desert, baking in the hot sun, confusion overtook him as he tried to understand what had happened. He was left for dead. He sat down in the shade for hours, pondering his predicament. Nobody in sight. No roads, no houses, no water, nothing. Just desert. To get more familiar with his surroundings, he climbed a tree and scanned the horizon. I was a completely different landscape from where I had been the day before, or however many days it had been since being robbed. The country was a lot more barren, leaving me with the impression I was even more isolated. I was lost, I was hungry, I was thirsty. I was still feeling the effects of whatever it was I'd been drugged with during what I assumed was the past two days. It was hot and no one besides the arseholes who'd left me there for dead had the slightest clue where to start looking for me, Ricky said. After getting his bearings from the sun, he figured due west was the best direction to find civilization. Hours into his trek, it occurred to him that he was probably walking further into the desolate interior, so he turned back east, in the hope of stumbling across a road or a river leading towards a homestead. He couldn't see any roads, so he headed for a big rise on the horizon to get a better view. When he reached the rise, all he saw was scrub and bare earth, now he was getting extremely thirsty. With no water source anywhere close, he started to contemplate the unthinkable. If you have to drink urine, I suggest you let it cool down first. It doesn't taste very nice, Ricky said. Trekking barefoot, his feet were already starting to soar and bleed. The sun started to set and now it was getting cold. There wasn't much time in the comfort zone between the two extremes. All Ricky wanted to do was keep walking, find a road, and get out of this situation. When it got too dark, he nestled next to some foliage trying to get some sleep. By midnight, it started raining. The replenishment of the water was an incredible relief. He cupped his hands and gulped down as much as he could. For the next few days, Ricky Miggy wandered through the desert, chasing potential rain clouds and drinking his urine. Still no roads in sight. He kept falling over as the weight of dehydration pulled him down. His main priority at this point was to find a water source. He staggered through some sparse scrub for a few more miles before finding the first sign of water, which was wet mud. He managed a few precious drops scraped out of the ground. Then he continued walking. He followed a trail of wet patches that soon turned into puddles and the puddles to sloshy channels, eventually finding his way to the edge of a thriving river. It was an incredible feeling to see such a torrent of water carving its way through the desert. I couldn't believe my luck and wasted no time diving in to get my fill a sea of salvation in the shape of a seasonal river flowing south. I praise the Lord or whatever caused me to cross its path, he said. One minute, Ricky was on the verge of death by dehydration. The next, he was flapping about in the current of a river. If my luck kept running like that, I'd be eating hamburgers for dinner, he thought to himself. By now, Ricky Meggie assumed all of his troubles were solved. Fresh water, a cool respite from the heat, and a chance to move long distances without wearing out his banged-up feet. Unfortunately, things don't always work out so easily. 
He makes his way downstream, half wading, half swimming, and found this was not an easy passage. He had to dodge the trees and branches, debris and wired fences buried under the water and carried by the fast moving current. Then suddenly around a bend, a windmill appeared. After four or five hours of struggling against the river, Ricky decided to camp at the windmill. He swam to the edge of the winding river and crawled out of the water, brimming with confidence. The brakes were finally going my way. Someone was bound to find me, he said. After a few days and a torrential rainstorm later, Ricky builds a shelter. While the rain provided essential hydration, food was scarce with only grass as his primary source of nourishment. I'd consumed so much of the rain-saturated crap, but it did nothing to satisfy my growing hunger pains, he said, and it was cold at night. Originally, food wasn't a priority as rescue and water, but as the days dragged on, the hunger became too much to bear. It was clear no one was coming to Windmill to rescue him, and he had to find his own way out. He was able to use the boards from the windmill to make a raft. He made an SOS sign out of the windmill blades and an arrow in the direction he planned to travel. I had to take the risk. With no sign of being rescued, it was time to leave my fortress and float away, McGee said. Ricky McGee had been floating for hours when a path floated into view. He paddled over to the river edge and felt a sense of relief that there were signs of life. He decided that he had to take the chance and follow the path, even if that meant leaving the sustainability of the river. Ricky gets off the raft and takes the gamble and starts his trek to follow the path. A couple of hours into the walk, he began to contemplate going back in search of the river again when he came across the main path. The countryside still resembled the sparsely vegetated dust bowl he'd been walking through since leaving the river, but it looked more promising. He walked for a few more miles before he stumbled on a fence that seemed like a real property fence, with red gates and a big sign on it. The sensation of setting eyes on a property sign that someone else had put there was one of pure amazement. All that walking had paid off. My heartache soothed instantly, Meggie said. He'd been stuck out there for a week already. Finally, it felt like he was getting closer to being found. There were a few calves and cows wandering the land, but at that stage, cow slaughtering remained a last resort as it looked like too much effort and still felt confident of being rescued. He continued down the path. Blood was pouring from his feet again. He was walking on an open sore and dared not to take a look at them. He wrapped his feet in his shirt as extra padding pounding the dirt with temperatures climbing to a scorching 120 degrees, there was no escaping from the heat. As night fell, the chill of the darkness was freezing. He woke up and continued his trek down the road. When thirst was gripping him, Ricky got down on his knees and prayed for rain. Within 15 minutes, it was pissing down. I couldn't believe it. I don't know what it feels like to win the lottery, but I imagine it doesn't get much better than taking water on the back of your parched throat in those circumstances especially when you know it's the only thing in the whole world that will keep you alive for another day, he said. He'd been walking down the road for more than a day without a hint of another human being. Then he came across an intersection that had two signs pointing east and west that read Bori to the left and Wallamunga Yards to the right. Ricky was now in a dilemma. He chooses Wallamunga Yards. It was all downhill in the direction of Western Australia and figured that the word yards was a good sign that some signs of life would be around. He walked a few miles and eventually arrived, nothing but worn out cattle yards and no signs of life. So he turned around back to the intersection. Now all of his energy was spent and needed to rest. He found shade and sat down as the hunger kept gnawing at him. So he went searching. He spotted a dead tree hollow inside. Without hesitating, he stuck his hand inside, searching for any nourishment. Then he felt a pinch something latched onto his finger. When pulled out his arm, he saw a bush centipede had bitten him. He panicked as the pain raced up his arm and started swelling. He raced to the sign at the intersection and made a run to Bori. It couldn't be that far to this place, Bori. I'd die on this road otherwise. The dingoes will eat me. I've got to find a doctor, Ricky said. He's screaming in pain running down the road. This is the first time he truly believed he was going to die from something other than exposure. The left side of his body throbbed as he ran down the path. The pain became blinding as the sun set. He didn't know what to do. Then he ran into a fence hidden by the darkness. He thought he saw car lights. He yelled, trying to chase it, believing this was his only hope. He couldn't go on anymore. He plopped down. Tears were running down his face as the venom was coursing through his body. 
Now the left side of his neck and face had swelled. He could feel the buildup of fluid choking him as he passes out. It was the raindrops that awoken him the next day. He realized his arm didn't sting and could feel his face. He was alive, but had gone completely off course and was more lost than ever. Now there was no sign of the Bori intersection or a path. With no substantial food in his stomach for the previous 10 days, the hunger pains grew worse as the pain of the centipede bite subsided. Eating grass and roots wasn't enough. He was now tired of the cold of the desert and constructed a shelter made of mud, grass, and cow manure. My cowshit mud barricade stood about 60 centimeters tall by the time I'd finished constructing it and crawled inside for a much needed sleep. The absurdity of smelling like a dirty cow's are certainly wasn't lost on me, but I couldn't see the funny side anymore. Life had become a bad joke, frankly. I was getting eaten by mozzies and drinking muddy, shitty water to stay alive, lying in shit, rubbing it over my body. What the hell was I doing out here? Mr. Miggy said. For days, he survived in his hut, killing a couple of small lizards and consuming grass. The rest and the replenishment were much needed, and he knew he had to keep moving. After a rare good night's rest, Ricky Meggy moved on thirst gripping him once again. He remembered once on a program on TV that a certain type of black rock meant there was water below the surface. He could see those same types of rocks and figured it was worth a shot to check out the bush survival theory for himself. He got up from his resting spot and walked a few hundred yards down to the bottom of a hill. He started digging furiously and then found muddy water. The deeper he dug, the clearer the water was. I buried my face into the pool that was filling up and tried to filter out the mud with my teeth as best I could. I couldn't help laughing at my new bush survival skills, Ricky said. With enough fluids to continue on, he wanted to find the source. He walked another half mile down when came upon a big green mound nestled in the distance. As he made his way closer, he saw that not only was it a dam, but one so full it was overflowing. Days of drinking stagnant water combined with his chopped up feet from all the walking was all the convincing he needed to settle at the dam for a few days to recuperate. This plan was especially confirmed when he realized the dam was surrounded by all types of vegetation. He could see frog holes and yabby tracks. The water in the dam felt as fresh as if God had personally filled it himself, and I splashed around swimming from bank to bank looking for a fill of vegetation. The healthy amount of food lining the edge of the dam meant I could just slide up while flapping in the water and take a sample, he said. In his enthusiasm, he managed to dig a hole for shelter that was comfortable enough for the first night. But the constant attack from mozzies, giant Australian mosquitoes, was constant throughout the ordeal and didn't let up at the watering hole. So he had to build a shelter if he was going to make this watering hole his home. Over the course of the next two weeks, Mr. Meggy ate nearly everything he could find. Lizards, frogs, leeches, snakes, grasshoppers, and caterpillars. Anything that slithered, crawled, scurried, or crept across the desert floor was fair game. In fact, he developed an affinity for certain kinds of frogs over others. Leeches, he said, are okay, but you must eat them quickly, otherwise they attach to the inside of your mouth. But it hadn't rained much, and the dam was drying out quickly. He kept hearing planes in the distance and it had become too much. Combined with the strength he built up from having a constant food source, water and rest, it gave him the will to set out on one final bid for freedom. It was hard to leave the comfort of the dam, but Ricky was confident that he'd find another watering hole. The sun was burning his face and lips. Even the tops of his hands were getting torched. But as it was looking bleak, he spots a big green mound in the distance. Meggie hurries towards the mound. At last, he made it to the mound. Ricky located a big watering hole, which had two overflow dams lapping on either side. Crawling to the edge of the first overflow, he grabbed handfuls of bopples and shoved them down his mouth. After regaining some strength with food and water, he went on to work on another shelter, but this one would be different. There was timber next to the dam, sourced from the tall trees just a stone's throw away. Rick would work on this structure for days, Ricky McGee was dealing with the disappointment of not being rescued. He felt as if he was being ignored. It has been weeks now, and he was settling into a routine of building and reinforcing his shelter. It gave him a job to do to distract him from the loneliness and dwelling on his current situation. His mind wandered constantly, 
The frustration of seeing planes fly over consumed him. He became disillusioned about his prospects of being rescued and had run out of ideas to make someone notice him. As the days went by, his energy and food sources were depleting. His bones were poking out of his skin and his eyes sank into his skull. He'd lost so much weight, his calf and thigh muscle had virtually disappeared. Then, when it couldn't get any worse, he felt an unbearable pain in his mouth from a rotten tooth. Blisters inside his gums stretched from the back of his lips to the back of his throat, making it impossible to eat anything. With starvation already hovering, he knew he'd be dead soon if he couldn't eat. The pain was so excruciating he hadn't eaten in the last few days. He knew he had no other choice but to deal with the rotten tooth. He grabbed some wire he used to screw a frog's with, stuck the wire inside his mouth, and shredded the skin inside his mouth. He popped the blisters, and his mouth filled with black blood and puss. He nearly threw up. Now that the blisters were gone, he could open his rotten tooth. He put a finger inside. He felt a tooth wiggling. It was now time to deal with it. With tears in his eyes, with the same piece of wire, he hooked it under the loose part of the tooth, and he used all his remaining strength to pull on the wire. A ripping sound echoed through his enclosure as the tooth detached. My rotten tooth was undoubtedly my worst experience. It was horrifying. What I had to do to extract that thing still sickens me when I think about it, Ricky says. But he was still in pain and eating was painful. He was able to consume small bopples, but nothing of significance as it was too painful to move his jaw. He was confined for five days in his shelter dealing with the tooth. When he tried to walk, he fell over. He took a swim the dam and was able to get his bearing about himself. It had been 71 days in the desert, living in a makeshift shelter on the side of an oasis in the middle of nowhere. By late afternoon, he was preparing for his daily food collection when he heard something resembling a motor. Rushing outside his shelter, he was met by the sight of a four-wheel drive. With two young guys up front, two jackaroos, or Australian ranch hands, who had been sent out from the nearest cattle station to perform their day's labor. Their first order of business required them to head into some of the most desolate parts of the country that surrounded them. In this part of the northern outback, that meant going into some of the most isolated pockets on the continent. As they slowly worked their way across the expanse, they saw something moving off in the distance. It was something unfamiliar, something odd and foreign to the regular scenery. They drove closer to investigate, as they drew closer, their curiosity only grew as Ricky Meggy rose and fell in the distance. As they approached, the two wide-eyed jackaroos looked at each other in disbelief. The mysterious figure they had found appeared to be a walking, stumbling, living skeleton. I couldn't believe it. After all this time, I wasn't exactly sure, but I thought I'd been waiting for someone to come along for pretty close to three months. I had hardly absorbed this incredible twist in my fate before new thoughts began rushing through my racing brain. Ricky said. The jackaroos only stopped at the dam as an afterthought because they were in that corner of the station and didn't want to come back all this way in the furthest corner of the furthest paddock again for a while. Because of that decision, they found Mr. Meggy. He made the 45-minute ride to the homestead. The station nurse looked at him in horror she saw this human being, just skin and bones, just days away from death. While he wanted some meat, the nurse explained that he had to be weaned back on solid food so he had a bowl of fruit and pumpkin soup. After a good meal in his stomach, Ricky called his sister, who started crying at the sound of his voice. She didn't have the heart to tell their mother Ricky was missing. A day later, Ricky was on a plane to Darwin Hospital. During his rehab, Ricky described his insatiable hunger during his hospital stay. Later, the police interviewed Ricky about the events leading up to being left for dead in the Australian outback. The cops doubted his story, even though they found his car around where he was described. At this point, Ricky didn't care if the men that robbed him were brought to justice. The fact that I made it out alive, that was my payback to those guys, he said. To this day, many people doubt Ricky Meggie's story about how he ended up in the situation to be stranded in the Australian desert. He was fortunate to be stranded during a good wet season, as having water meant he wasn't going to die in days. For someone with virtually no bush experience, I think Ricky did remarkably well, his doctor said. Months after the ordeal, Ricky Miggy returned to the dam with a friend. As closure to the ordeal, many human beings wouldn't have survived. Ricky Miggy is a living testament to the resilience of the human spirit. He survived against all odds.
I had plenty of opportunities to give up, but each time I found a way to hang on just long enough for someone to find me. What I lived through is probably more than most people will have to endure, but anyone can apply those same instincts I relied on to problems confronting them. As the old saying goes, whatever doesn't kill you can only make you stronger. Always remember that life is worth living and be prepared to fight for it with every ounce of your soul. You just never know what tomorrow might bring. In October 2010, three teens from Tokelau would find out how dangerous and remote these waters can be. Etweni Nassau, 14, Samu Palesa, 15, and Philo Philo, 15, drifted 300 kilometers across an empty and little-traveled section of the Pacific Ocean. It began in the grand tradition of ill-considered ideas, with a group of boys and a bottle of booze. The boys were gathered in their clubhouse near the end of the only road in the only village on the Pacific island of Atapu. Atapu is one of three atolls that make up the nation of Tokelau. The total amount of land on Atapu is 1.4 square miles, population 524. The nearest atoll, equally tiny, is 57 miles to the south, well beyond the range of visibility. The closest significant landmass is Samoa, a 28-hour ferry ride away. There is no landing strip on Tokelau. There are also no dogs, prisons, lawyers, pavement, or soil. The land is mostly bits of broken coral. The highest elevation is 15 feet. Coconuts and fish are the traditional diet. From any point on Atafu's shoreline, nothing can be seen but water, all the way to the horizon. They were drinking vodka, smoking cigarettes, and telling stories. It was getting late. Then someone brought up the tale of the teenagers. Five or six years previous, three teens had taken a boat without permission and broken one of the cardinal rules of Tokelauan society. They'd ventured into the open ocean without the escort of a Tautai, a master fisherman. The ocean is an unpredictable and occasionally violent place, and the title of Tautai, bestowed by the island's elders, is equivalent to a driver's license. Even Tautais do not venture far offshore. The isolation of Atafu can at times be difficult to bear. Philo stated Atafu felt like a prison. The desire to escape can become overwhelming. And as a plastic jug of vodka was passed around, the old story soon morphed into a new idea. By the time the jug was finished, the idea had become a plan. And so almost on a whim, when the plans became serious, when Samu announced he'd be willing to steal his uncle's new boat, and most everyone in the clubhouse began backpedaling from their bluster, Etueni spoke up. He said he was in. Philo, Samu, and Etueni fanned out across the village. Their first mission was to find gasoline, and they soon collected about 20 gallons in five plastic jerry cans. They stashed the stolen gas in Samu's uncle's boat, a silver-colored Froza, made in New Zealand, with a 15-horsepower Yamaha engine. There was nothing fancy about it. A couple of unpainted wooden benches, a tiny storage space in the bow that could keep a few things dry. The only items inside were a small machete and a wooden mallet used to club fish. It's freeboard. The distance between the water and the top of the boat's sides was just 16 inches, enough to repel only the smallest of waves. The boat's best feature was not visible. Inside the hull were three large air-filled aluminum cylinders, pontoons that made the craft exceptionally stable. After loading the gas, the boys again separated dashing the short distance from the dock to the village. Philo sneaked into his house and grabbed a green tarpaulin, a large plastic sack containing 20 coconuts, a white ceramic teacup, two packs of Pall Mall cigarettes, and another jug of vodka, still sealed. From his refrigerator, he took two bottles of milk and a Kraft mayonnaise jar filled with water. Samu, meanwhile, climbed a tree and knocked down nine more coconuts. Etueni had been instructed to find fishing equipment, but he was concerned that he'd wake someone up and get caught. So there was no fishing gear. The boys boarded the boat. To steal their resolve, they opened the vodka, poured it in the teacup, added a bit of water, and passed it around. This time, Etueni joined in. Samu started the engine. It was the final chance to run home, to sleep in a bed. Etueni later admitted that as he sat in the boat, he'd thought that this was a dangerous and stupid idea. I almost jumped off, he says. But then Philo began yelling, and Samu and Etwaini joined in. A rebel yell, a primal scream. 
a howl that tried to both express and eclipses their nervous, excited joy. They soon began shouting people's names, those they'd stolen from. They teased Samu's uncle. Ha ha, we're leaving, we stole your boat. And they motored through the gap in the reef surrounding Atapu. It was the first time any of the boys had been on the ocean side of Tokelau without a master fisherman. Their plan was to reach the next atoll. They figured it would take three or four days. They had only the clothes they wore, shorts and t-shirts and sandals. They continued drinking. Etweni was bartender, water and vodka, in their one teacup. Philo was the first to tire out. He curled up on the bottom of the boat. Samu and Etweni stayed up, still drinking. Somehow, in his insobriety, Etweni took off his shirt and lost it overboard. Samu controlled the engine. We just had an idea of following one star, says Etweni. But we didn't know what star it was. Then Samu too grew sleepy. So Etweni drove for a while. Eventually he switched off the engine. And soon all three boys were passed out on the flat metal bottom of the boat. Etweni woke first, to the noise of a couple of dozen seagulls flying around. He could no longer see land. The bright sun, he realized, eliminated the idea of following one star. Philo was next up. He immediately vomited over the side. Then Samu awoke and he too threw up. They began cracking coconuts, banging them against the rail of the boat, drinking the liquid and chucking them away. They didn't even bother scraping out the coconut meat. Then they finished both bottles of milk. They broke out the cigarettes. Only six were dry. They smoked them. They ran the engine intermittently. It was a warm and overcast day. Their new idea was to follow the seagulls. The birds would naturally head back to land. But the birds seemed to be flying randomly, maybe in big circles. As the afternoon wore on, they grew a little hungry. They wondered what people were saying about them back on Atafu. Eventually, the sun set. We were still in a good mood, says Philo, not that hungry. They slept again in a puddle on the bottom of the boat. The next day, they saw an airplane. It was flying low, and they figured it was looking for them. Etuani waved, and the other two boys immediately teased him for wanting to be rescued so soon, so he stopped waving. Philo and Samu didn't think two days was enough to seem heroic. They figured as the plane flew away, that it would eventually be back. Back on Atafu, a town meeting was called to discuss the disappearance of the boys. The prevalent feeling was, oh no, not again. The island was still recovering from a tragedy eight months earlier, in February of 2010, when three men on a barge were caught in a storm. Their boat capsized. The bodies washed ashore. And now three more were missing. The forecast was for stormy weather. Help was requested from the Royal New Zealand Air Force. It swiftly sent out a P-3 Orion military surveillance plane with radar capable of detecting something as tiny as a submarine periscope. The total search area was more than 8,500 square miles. The plane searched three separate times, returning once to Samoa to refuel for a total of eight hours. At this point, approaching the third night with no idea where they were, their supplies pitifully meager. You might think that panic would have set in, but they had not they were sure someone would soon rescue them. On the next day, they finished the mayonnaise container of water and continued drinking the coconuts, this time making sure to scrape the insides. By that evening, they had used up all the gas. They could now only drift with the current. They threw all the fuel containers overboard. When they went to sleep, they had exactly 11 coconuts left. Their sleep was fitful and wet. The wind picked up. Etueni who'd lost his shirt the first night was especially cold. In the morning, there was still nothing but water all around them. No rescue boat, no airplane. Etweni finally said it. Shouldn't we be found by now? The response from the others? They laughed at me, Etweni says. Their mouths grew very dry. Despite storm forecasts, it had not rained at all during the trip, and the only edible items were coconuts. That day, they each drank and ate too, an extravagant use of their supplies, yet it wasn't nearly enough to slake their thirst or satiate their hunger. By the time they went to sleep that night, they had precisely five coconuts left. At sunrise on the fifth day, the day the teens who had previously stolen a boat had been rescued, the boys all finally admitted aloud that they'd like to go back, that they wished they were home. Day six, the three were well aware that they'd made a terrible mistake. Soon they were down to their last coconut thirst was like a hand around their throats. That's when we started thinking about drinking seawater, says Etueni. 
Philo warned them that this was a bad idea. The next morning, Samu, the lifelong Tokelauan, announced, I'm drinking it, and dipped the teacup into the ocean. He started sipping. Then I got sick of looking at Samu drinking it, says Etueni. Me too, says Philo. They all drank seawater together. Finally, more than a week into the trip, it rained. And for the first time, the boys used the green tarp. They took it out and spread it open in order to catch rainwater. Samu, Philo, and Etueni saw plenty of fish. The shadow of the drifting dinghy created a kind of artificial reef that attracted many small fish, which in turn enticed larger ones. There were also the ever-circling birds, who dive for fish during the day and sleep bobbing on the water at night. All the food the boys needed was visible to them, yet just out of reach. For a while, Etwini tried fishing with his hand, just holding it in the water over the side of the boat. He says he actually felt fish, but could never grab them. Through sheer happenstance, the boys did actually catch a few fish. The chief disadvantage of the low-sided boat was that seawater continuously splashed in. A wave of any size would break over the gunnels. Bailing during the day, using the mayonnaise jar, was constant. And at night, the boat slowly filled up. But every so often, a total of four times during the trip, the waves carried along a fish that would flop into the boat. All of their skin soon grew torturously itchy rashes. The boys have dark latte-colored skin, but the sun still overwhelmed them, igniting severe burns. About two weeks in, they began bickering. By this point, the boys were starving. It's like your stomach is being ripped apart, says Etueni. Of course, they weren't in good moods. We got angry easily, says Etueni. They had nothing to divert themselves. They lost track of how many days they'd been gone. The disk of the sun slowly traveled overhead. In rough weather, they rode the great ocean swells, rising and falling, sometimes 30 feet or more as if the sea were breathing. The horizon was naked, save for the incessant waves that formed a swaying divide between ocean and sky. Later on, a storm blew in. It rained for two and a half days, the only major storm the boys encountered. They couldn't bail fast enough. Water rose to the benches. They shivered violently. Rain, even in the tropics, comes in cold. So they wrapped themselves under the tarp sitting cross-legged. From outside the boat, they would have looked like a small green haystack. It was warm in there, so despite the boat filling up and in danger of sinking, they sat for an entire day, huddled naked, rain hammering down, thrashed by winds. They say they felt like a team at this moment, dependent on one another, helping one another, just the three of them in a tiny boat amid an endless sea. A few nights later, they spotted a ship. It was a large one, the deck outlined in orange lights. They hadn't seen a boat since leaving Tokelau. It was difficult to tell how far away it was. They thought, let's make a sail and catch up. So they held up the tarpaulin and tried to harness the wind. But it was exhausting work. So they debated whether to jump in the water and swim for it. Should only Samu go? Should they all go? They couldn't decide. And the boat motored away. They felt terrible. They wondered if that was their only chance, if they'd die before seeing another ship. They thought about all the food on that boat, the warmth, the beds. They blamed one another for not jumping in the water and at least making an active attempt at saving their lives. Now all they could do was sit in their dinghy and wait. Soon after the ship passed, Ektweni quit. He stopped talking. He curled up in the bow. He didn't even sit up. He just lay all day in the bottom of the boat, mute, mostly unmoving eyes half-lidded. He did this for weeks. Deep in his silent stage, pondering suicide, Etueni was alone, confined to the bow of the boat. One afternoon, a bird, one of the gray gulls that hung around the dinghy, landed on the boat. The boys were half comatose. They stared at the bird. A few days later, another bird came. It was just after a big rainstorm, and there was water in the tarp. This time, Samu tried to catch it. He was stealthy. He crouched low and grabbed the bird by the neck. They ate a bite of raw meat, but even in their hunger, it was worse than yuck. So they dried the carcass in the sun, and it was good. Afterwards, says Etwani, we wanted more. They drank the water in the tarp. The sea was so calm that waves didn't splash into the dinghy. Etwani ended his silence. The bird finally helped, he says, and I started talking. It was a good day. We were friends again, says Etwani. We were happy that day but no more birds ever landed on the boat. The relief provided by those few bites of meat did not last long. 
It only served to reawaken their hunger pangs, their long, dormant stomachs gurgling with digestive juices. But there was nothing more. Soon they were hungrier than ever. The sun continued to beat down, the sea stretched all around, limitless and cruel. At times, Samu and Philo spent a few minutes bobbing in the water to cool off, but Etwini felt too frail to leave the dinghy. During one of these dips, the boys found barnacles on the bottom of the boat. Samu was the first to eat them. They were better than not eating. They gave some to Etwini. Then, during one swim, Philo let go of the boat, trying to snap off a barnacle. The current was strong, and he drifted away. He was too weak to catch up, but Samu held the dinghy in one hand and swam with the other, tugging the boat. It was an incredible feat considering his condition. He managed to swim fast enough to reach Philo. He grabbed his hand. He helped haul him into the boat. That was the last time anyone went swimming. They were crazed with hunger, desperate beyond any measure. Their bodies were rotting before their eyes. Starvation lowered their internal temperatures and they were colder than ever at night. Their bodies had used up all their fat. It was working on their muscles. Their minds would go next. They ate some of the hair that fell off their heads. They ate bits of their fingernails. They were dying. And then the rash on Philo's skin reached the point of excruciation. He was under the tarp in the middle of the night and felt what he described as an electric shock across his body. He leapt up. He screamed, God, please help. Take this pain away. He yelled louder. God, please forgive me. He wanted to tear off his skin. He couldn't stand it any longer. He was finished. He grabbed the machete. He begged Samu to kill him. Stab me, stab me, he begged Etwini. I felt like I was burning. I'd rather die than endure the pain. I was screaming at them to stab me. I was serious. Both boys refused. How are you going to see your parents? Samu asked. Eventually, the pain subsided. Exhaustion gripped him. And so they prepared to die. They stopped bailing. It was too much effort. Etwini got sick. He vomited repeatedly, but little came out. It stopped raining. They drank seawater. We all quit, says Etwini, like it makes no difference if we die or live. They were all lying about in the bottom of the boat in the most weakened possible state, covered by the tarp, close to death. And then Samu pulled himself up for a moment to see if rain clouds were coming. And he said one word. He said, yes. And he raised his arm and started waving. Boys, he said, I can see a boat. Etwini and Philo didn't believe him. A few times before, he had pretended to spot a boat, and when the others looked, he'd laugh. No one else thought it was funny. So they made him promise he wouldn't do it again. Now they thought he was joking once more. Boys, Samu said again, get up. There was something in his voice. Philo and Etwini got up, and there, directly in front of them, was a ship, the San Nicanau. I started waving, but I could only lift my arm for a few seconds, says Etwini. I wondered if it was a dream. They feared the ship would pass by. It didn't seem to be stopping. But then, from way above, the ship's navigator, Ty Fredrickson, called out. He asked if they needed help. The boys screamed, yes, and the ship lowered a small rescue boat. Fredrickson snapped a photo. It is an extraordinary and heartbreaking image. Three naked boys, staring at their rescuer, reduced to skin and bones. Philo and Samu started crying, but Etwaini didn't. He was too dehydrated. I couldn't cry, he says. I had no more tears. They had floated some 750 miles. They'd been gone more than seven weeks. With help, they were too weak to walk. They boarded the San Nicunao. Their dinghy and its engine were also saved to be returned to Tokelau. They sat in the galley, bewildered and overwhelmed by the scent of food. Fredrickson gave them some electrolyte drink and a bit of bread. Etwini ate an apple, but it made him sick and he vomited into a bowl in the kitchen. They showered, they borrowed clothes, Samu made the first phone call. He called his grandmother. There were celebrations across Tokelau. The boys all slept that night in one bed, in Fredrickson's berth. At the Colonial War Memorial Hospital in Fiji's capital, Suva, the boys were treated for extreme dehydration, fungal infections, and second-degree burns. They were anemic. They had elevated heart rates, gross muscle wasting, and widespread infections. Etwini lost two teeth. Leanne Pierce, Tokelau's director of health says they would likely not have survived another week. They spent a few days in the hospital, then flew to Samoa, where they moved in with a Tokelauan family to rest and recuperate. Samu, who had never before left Tokelau, came down with the chicken pox. Finally, just after Christmas, they were cleared to take the long ferry ride back to Atafu. They made it back to Atafu, where there was a big welcome feast. 
Samu gave a speech in which he apologized for their actions. Everyone says that God's got things in store for us. They could feel it. Adafu was too small for them. There was too much water everywhere they looked. All that suffering had just brought them back to the place they nearly killed themselves trying to escape. Within two months of returning home, they all left Adafu. Philo and Samu went with their families to Australia. Etwaini moved with his family to Hawaii. None of them know if they'll ever go back. For Harrison Okini, the Gulf of Guinea would be a tomb of dread. On May 26, 2013, stormy weather caused rough waters off the coast of Nigeria. The tugboat Jaskin 4 rocked on the dark water as it carried out an important mission. The 12-man crew was there to secure a 700-foot oil tanker full of gasoline that had just been collected from the Chevron platform. As part of the $3 billion industry that extracts 238,000 gallons of oil from the ocean yearly, the massive tanker was being thrown around on the rough waters. The Jaskin 4 was called to fix a line to the tanker to keep it from capsizing and releasing thousands of gallons of oil into the ocean. Although the oil tanker was massive compared to the Jaskin 4, it couldn't withstand the force of Mother Nature. The crew on the tugboat didn't seem too concerned about the dangerous waters because they were used to going on these types of missions in similar conditions. It didn't occur to them that they were also in danger. Among the crew was 29-year-old Harrison Okini. He was the cook on the Jaskon 4 and had been on missions like this several times. He knew the risks of being in dangerous waters next to massive oil tankers like the one the crew was helping that day. Okeni knew that as long as he cooked good food and didn't make the captain sick, his job was secure. On the morning of May 26, 2013, he awoke at 5 a.m. to start prepping food like every other day on the boat. He sleepily got out of bed and headed to the bathroom. He felt the way most people feel when they have to wake up at 5 a.m. on a Sunday. Shortly after Okeni sat down to do his morning business, a huge wave smacked into the side of the Jaskon 4. It sprayed the deck with water and cracked pieces of the hull. The massive wave hit the Jaskon 4 with so much force that it flipped the tugboat on its side. Okini was still in the bathroom and he was thrown out of the stall as the boat started sinking. He rushed out of the bathroom and ran down the hall to the emergency hatch. Three of his crewmates were already trying to seal off that hatch, but a huge wave of freezing water hit them. They were carried into the abyss and Okini knew the men were dead. Trapped below deck, he had no time to think, with his only escape route blocked by rushing water. He had nowhere to go. Okini fought against the current to get to the officer's cabin. However, the water was too strong. It pushed him back into the bathroom attached to the captain's room and against a wall as the waves rolled the boat upside down. The Jaskin 4 started sinking to the bottom of the ocean, but something strange happened along the way. Okini didn't drown. As water filled the room, he swam up and got caught in a four-foot air bubble. It was completely dark, so Harrison Okini hung on as the tugboat sank further. It seemed like the boat had been sinking for hours when it finally settled on the ocean floor. Harrison was sweating even in the freezing water because he was terrified. He was trapped in what he thought would be his watery grave. Harrison couldn't move from his air bubble. He had to tread water or use his strength to hold his head above the water. He maintained his breathing because he knew his oxygen was limited. He had no food, light, or water and was practically nude in freezing water. Initially, he thought there was no way anyone would find him because everyone else on board was dead. But Harrison Okini refused to give up, knowing the freezing water or excessive carbon monoxide would eventually take him. He didn't know what to do, so he just prayed. Okini said, all around me was just black and noisy. I was crying and calling on Jesus to rescue me. I prayed so hard. I was so hungry and thirsty and cold and I was just praying to see some kind of light. When the Jaskin 4 flipped, Nigerian rescue crews got the Mayday call. But they couldn't do anything because the storm was too strong. There wouldn't have been time to perform a rescue operation before the boat started sinking. It left Okini in a tough spot. While he waited underwater, hoping someone would find him, rescue crews knew there wasn't much they could do when it sunk. Even when the weather cleared, there were still hazards with someone swimming inside the upside-down ship at the bottom of the ocean. Harrison had no idea how far down the boat had sunk, 
and didn't know rescuers even knew something had happened. Unfortunately, the Jaskon 4 was sitting 100 feet below the surface. Professional scuba divers are not allowed to dive deeper than 100 feet for more than 20 minutes. If rescuers tried to go inside the sunken tugboat, it would take longer than 20 minutes to retrieve bodies and inspect the ship. Meanwhile, Mr. Okini was starving, freezing, and pruning like a raisin. He had to hold onto a sink to keep his head above water. Harrison was struggling to stay above the water because he was growing tired. He knew he needed to get out of the water and rest because the salt was peeling his skin. He decided to make a risky move, using his last bit of strength to swim into the officer's cabin. He swam into the darkness, avoiding dangerous obstacles and collected whatever wooden objects he could find. Mr. O'Kaney made a few trips to gather enough wood to fashion a small raft. It wasn't anything great, but it floated and got him out of the water. The small raft allowed O'Kaney to dry off, warm up, and rest his aching muscles. He was left alone with his thoughts, reviewing his life until that point. The only sounds he heard were his breath and the water hitting the sides of the cabin. It was so quiet that Harrison could hear his dead crew members being eaten by fish and other unseen sea life. Harrison thought about how much time he had left and wondered if anyone would find him. He thought about his family and friends. O'Kenny lay on his makeshift raft for nearly three days. All he could do was pray and wait for a slow death when the oxygen ran out. He lost track of time lying there and hours felt like days. He didn't know if anyone would find him or if anyone was even looking. He didn't know when his time would come and he would be laid to rest with his crew. Luckily, that moment didn't come. After almost three days, a South African dive team was able to get down to the wreckage. They salvaged what they could, swimming through the depths in full gear with flashlights. The divers found the bodies of 10 dead crew members who didn't make it out of the wreckage. The divers then headed into the ship to investigate. They swam through the dark wreckage of the Jaskon 4. As the divers were looking around, Harrison heard a noise he hadn't heard before. Okini was so shocked when he heard a metallic tapping on the ship. He knew he was running out of oxygen, so he got off his raft and tore the faucet from the sink. He pulled himself up and started banging the faucet against the ceiling. He wanted to make as much noise as possible so the divers would know someone was alive. Harrison Okini worried if they didn't hear him, the divers would leave him to die. He also worried that the divers would mess up whatever was keeping the air bubble intact. Okini made as much noise as possible. Moments later, he saw a flashlight down the hallway. It was the first light he had seen in nearly three days. He didn't want to scare the diver and cause a problem, so Okini gently tapped him as he swam by. Harrison worried the diver would try to stab him, thinking he was being attacked by a creature from the deep. Although the diver was startled, they were happy to see someone alive. Harrison Okini had become an accidental aquanaut. His rescue was captured on a dive camera, showing him reaching out to the diver and standing in the small air bubble. He was only in his underwear and more than ready to end this horrifying ordeal. On May 28, 62 hours after the Jaskin 4 capsized and sank, Harrison Okini was on his way to the surface. He was starving, dangerously dehydrated and exhausted. The divers equipped him with a rebreather and oxygen tank, guiding him out of the wreckage and toward the surface. He used his last ounce of strength to swim with them, but he couldn't get out of the water just yet. Harrison had been underwater for so long and inhaled so much nitrogen that bringing him straight to the surface would have killed him immediately. Before Okini could resurface, he had to enter a decompression chamber. Harrison was guided to a diving bell designed to maintain internal pressure to transfer him to the decompression chamber. He lost consciousness during the transfer but survived. He suffered from peeling skin due to prolonged saltwater exposure. The decompression chamber adjusts the body to normal air pressure after spending time in the deep ocean. After three days at the bottom of the ocean, Harrison Okini had to spend 60 hours in the chamber. Even though the decompression chamber was small, it was an improvement from his air bubble. Okini also dealt with recurring nightmares and insatiable hunger, but otherwise he was in good health. He thought at least a few of his crewmates got off the boat before it sank, but soon learned he was the sole survivor. On June 1, 2013, Okaney was finally released from the hospital. He was able to go home and see his family after thinking he would never hug them again. The terrifying underwater ordeal is believed to be the longest any human has ever survived, trapped underwater. 
People trapped in closed rooms face serious problems because the concentration of carbon dioxide rises when they start breathing. The level rises until it becomes toxic and a person can suffocate within a few hours. However, O'Kenny survived for three days. Although he was happy to see his mother and wife again, Harrison had to deal with PTSD and anxiety for a while. He would wake up in the middle of the night feeling like his bed was sinking. Harrison had worked on boats for years before the Jaskin Four sank. However, the ordeal made him say he would never go into the ocean again. He suffered for a few years before he decided to overcome his fear of the ocean. After almost two years of staying out of the water, Mr. O'Kenny became a certified commercial diver in 2015. The rescue diver who discovered him in the wrecked ship presented O'Kenny with his diving certificate. It was a heartwarming moment and a new chapter of his journey. Since getting back in the water, O'Kenny has found a newfound love for the ocean and diving. He is now an IMCA Class II commercial air diver and can dive to depths of 160 feet. Harrison said, I am enjoying diving, it's life for me, it's fun. Although he was once scared of the ocean, Harrison O'Kenny enjoys being in the water now. No one could have imagined that he would get back in the water and feel comfortable after what he went through. He worked hard to overcome his fears. For Gigi Wu, venturing into the Taiwanese wilderness would be catastrophic. Gigi Wu, 36, an avid mountain climber, was trying to conquer the 100 peaks of Taiwan, a group of mountains, each at least 10,000 feet above sea level, that are deemed to be the most demanding on the island. In one of these ascents, this is when she first encountered Alex Yang in 2014 on Jade Mountain, home to the highest peak in Northeast Asia, at 13,000 feet. They embarked on that trip with a climbing group organized by a travel agency, then bonded over their love of photography as they ascended. Yang was shocked when, at the summit, his new friend shed her gear down to a swimsuit top and set up a photo shoot. Wu explained a challenge and a dare to conquer the 100 peaks. And at some point along the way, she'd lost a bet with a friend, the payout being that she had to pose in a bikini top when she reached her next summit. Eventually, what started out as a dare for a slender, demure girl who had grown up hiding behind glasses turned into a tradition for a five, six inches young woman learning to lean into her beauty and her bravery. In the early mountaintop photos Wu posted to Facebook, her hair was stringy and unkempt, unflattering baggy hiking pants hung from her hips. As months passed, though, she pulled on increasingly vibrant swimsuits, her hair grew longer and straighter, and her poses turned more provocative. And with each photo, she attracted more attention and more followers. To some, the whole endeavor seemed a vanity project, sensationalism in a sacred space. But those close to her saw a devoted hiker using her allure to promote and preserve the mountain's beauty. On Facebook, Wu captioned her bikini photos with details about the route she had taken to the top and alerted fellow hikers about difficult portions of each ascent. She combined the glam shots with snaps of misty forests and craggy trails, translucent mountain pools, and vistas hanging above endless floors of clouds. While male commenters tended to laud her body, female followers christened her a mountain goddess. In July 2016, Wu finally reached all 100 summits. Wu, friends believe, sought to reclaim her body. What some saw as an object of lust, she turned into a symbol of pride, posing only on hard-to-reach plateaus where her fortitude would overshadow her figure. Anyone ogling her had to also gaze upon her success. It was impossible to write off her accomplishment as some simple stunt. Taiwan's topography rises sharply from the sea, presenting a formidable challenge for even the most experienced climber. She focused her posts instead on documenting where climbers could find water or cell service. She collected trash along her trails, took on extra weight to help injured or exhausted hikers, and pushed herself to explore new terrain. Yang, by then a close friend, bought her the satellite phone and a Garmin GPS. Now she was aiming beyond the 100 peaks. Her goal was to summit every one of Taiwan's 268 mountains that top 3,000 meters. As Gigi gained experience, fellow hikers struggled to keep pace, slowing her progress. She squabbled occasionally with friends over which trails to pursue and to avoid those tensions gravitated towards solo outings, a dangerous undertaking on unfamiliar trails. 
In May 2017, she set out alone across the Central Mountain Range before turning back, noting later online that a mistake made while hiking solo can be your last. A year later, she posted a photo of her legs, scarred and bruised from a dangerous fall that she said almost took her life. During one of her elaborate photo shoots, American climber John Solomon was astounded by what she carried. Before setting out on a trip, she and Alex Yang would weigh her pack. For longer journeys, the goal was to stay below 70 pounds, more than double Solomon's typical haul. Solomon and Wu traded notes and he encouraged her to lighten her load. She showed him her sustenance, candy bars that provided relatively little fuel for their weight, plus rice and noodles that required bulky cookware and on occasion extra water. He recommended swapping the candy for dehydrated meals. More concerning to Solomon, though, was the substantial equipment Wu had carried for her summit photo shoots, including a Canon 5D Mark III camera, a pair of large lenses, and a tripod. He suggested she could settle for less cumbersome gear. If she lost her balance, a light pack, one better proportion to her body mass, she was less likely to be overpowered and tumble down a mountainside. Solomon recalls how Wu cut their conversation short, politely waving off his suggestions and stepped back in front of her camera. On January 11, 2019, after riding three trains and a bus, then spending a night in a cheap hotel favored by hikers, Wu hit the trailhead on a two-week trek through Yushan National Park in central Taiwan. Her pack was laden with photo equipment, plus the food Yang had helped her purchase. Bread, cheese, meat, coffee, rice milk, pineapple cakes, and noodles. She planned to start on the Batongguan Historical Trail, a familiar path, but then deviate onto an unsanctioned and perilous aboriginal trail that neither she nor her hiking buddies had ever attempted. Her route would be a circuit, beginning and ending at the Dongpu Hot Springs to the west of the mountains, where Yang planned to pick her up on the 24th. Before setting off again, Wu consulted a weather report. The skies, she read, would be clear on the 18th, and the 19th, which looked to be two of her journey's most arduous legs. On the first of those days, right before she planned to split off onto the Aboriginal Trail, descending the northwest face of Jupin Mountain, a 10,000-foot peak, she posted a picture on Facebook, a blanket of clouds captioned, Celebrating Today. On the 19th, Wu veered from any clear trail. Her route was a vestige of an old one, her boots crushing wide swaths of shale and detritus from the thick canopy of trees. The terrain would have demanded that she negotiate the steepest descents using her hands to brace against tree trunks while keeping her footing in unceasingly damp conditions. The weather reports, though, had erred. Conditions worsened with every hour. Around noon, Wu messaged another friend who had helped her map out a route. She had reached an altitude of almost 8,000 feet and planned to push down closer to 5,000 before setting up camp near a small river at the base of two long ridges. When she arrived, she promised a friend to let him know she was safe. That friend says he never heard from her. Instead, at 4.30 p.m., Yang's phone rang. When Jiji Wu was alone in the mountains, she usually rang a friend around 6 p.m. She would let him know that miles of slick and jagged terrain were behind her and that she had finally freed herself of her 65-pound pack and was preparing to settle on a flat patch of earth for the night. That she would soon prepare her tea and rice just as the stars started to shine. But on a cold Saturday afternoon in January 2019, Alex Yang's phone rang at 4.30 p.m. Too early, he thought, too soon. He took the call in his office in Taipei. Wu was ringing on the satellite phone that Yang had bought her so she could stay tethered to the world during her increasingly dangerous solo ascents. Gigi typically spoke with a measured rasp, but now her words seemed hurried through the static. Over a frantic 30 seconds as her voice faded in and out, Yang deciphered that she had tumbled down a cliff and couldn't move her legs. She needed help. Wu begged Yang to remember the article they'd recently discussed, the one about a trail that long ago connected villages inhabited by Taiwan's aboriginal people. Remember that trail, she said? He did. He also knew that temperatures in those mountains would likely dip near freezing at night. Yang told her to stay warm, and then the call fell dead. His mind raced. Wu's voice conveyed a sense of urgency, but not fear. He knew she kept the phone in her pack. Her gear and food must be within reach. Besides, she had thousands of miles and hundreds of summits behind her. 
She was too experienced, too hardy to succumb. As Wu lay alone, Yang rushed to relay the call's coordinates to authorities at Yushan National Park, which spans 260,000 acres across the middle of Taiwan. Then he tried to call Gigi back, every five minutes, again and again and again. By the time he took Wu's distress call and relayed the coordinates to park authorities, who in turn relayed to the National Airborne Service Corps, the day had grown too late and the weather too poor to send out help on foot or by air. A new forecast suggested the skies would clear early in the morning, and while the temperature was predicted to dip overnight, it wasn't expected to fall below freezing. Deep into the night, he texted updates and reassurances to Gigi. The local fire department was summoning rescue hikers. Helicopters would be coming. Search and rescue will surge through the mountains to extract you. Yang received no response. At dawn, the rain kept coming. With the helicopters grounded in the fog, search and rescue personnel called upon volunteers from the Kalibun people, a segment of Taiwan's aboriginal Bunin tribe that tends to live at high elevations. Adept hikers, the Kalibun often work as mountain guides for travel companies and many of them help when a hiker goes missing. At 8 a.m. on the 20th, a firefighter and two Kalibun men hopped into the bed of a blue pickup truck. They began ascending gravelly mountain roads in hopes of rescuing a woman who once posed for a picture with a member of the Kalibun tribe when they crossed paths on the trail and who had photographed their remote mountains to share that beauty with the urban masses along the coasts. Armed with Wu's coordinates, plus food, tents, clothing, ropes, and a portable stretcher that could be hooked to an airlift rig, the Kalibuan traversed a mountain road up to 8,000 feet, the closest they could get to her last known location, before setting off into unfamiliar terrain on foot. Another team of three men, two Kalibuans and a firefighter, hung back, hoping they might be able to get closer to Wu by helicopter. But the fog and the rain lingered, so they too set off by foot around 1 p.m. After barreling down slick slopes for hours on end, 45 pounds of equipment strapped across each of their backs, the first rescue team finally reached an altitude of around 5,000 feet, near the coordinates Wu had relayed to Yang. They knew she had been alive at least within the last 28 hours, and as night began to blanket the mountains, they believed they had found her. Well below them, a mass, a body possibly, rested among a cluster of hiking equipment on a narrow platform jutting out from a cliffside that descended hundreds of feet to a river. A fall to the bottom would have meant certain death. But it appeared Wu had been lucky enough to land on that flat outcropping of the earth. They called down but drew no response, no movement. The mass below them lay quiet and still in the darkness. Rain and poor visibility made it impossible to descend the cliff face that night. Temperatures again dropped, just above freezing, too wet and too cold to start a fire. So the search and rescue teams retreated to their tents and waited, anguished, for dawn. The next day, they rigged ropes to the cliffside and over several hours navigated a path down the steep slope laden with trees, wet leaves, and stone. Wu was lying on her back, eyes closed and mouth bloodied when search and rescue reached her that morning. No breath, no pulse, skin cold to the touch. Her backpack had settled near her, a satellite and cell phone by her right side, and a flashlight tied to her left wrist. A silver aluminum sleeping pad covered most of her body, but her jacket was laid out next to her, perhaps odd to a hiking outsider given the night's chill. Debris from food and drink littered the ground. Without cover from the rain and cold, Gigi Wu died the night after her fall. She was wearing hiking clothes, but the material was thin. As the cold gripped her, and as she was unable to dig the tent out of her backpack, moderate hypothermia would have induced amnesia and lethargy. Eventually, she would have ceased shivering and felt warm, accounting for the cast-aside jacket. As her condition worsened, she may have hallucinated, perhaps explaining the toothbrush that seemed to have been carefully placed by her right hand. She might have believed she was settling in for another night's sleep in the mountains, no different from all the others. Her heart rate and breathing would have slowed. A coma would have followed, then death. They couldn't determine what had caused Wu's fall, but vanity didn't seem to have been a factor. Her camera equipment was tucked neatly in its bag. The rescuers found her identification in her backpack, then reported her death. Thousands flocked to Gigi Wu's Facebook page, 
which turned into a memorial. Loving goodbyes interspersed with photos of the climber wearing bright swimsuits atop the mountains she had conquered. Admirers praised her for spurring interest in climbing among her countrywomen, for exemplifying the inner strengths they themselves may not have realized, and for being a role model to young girls who might not otherwise have strived for anything beyond physical beauty. Alongside the praise were harsh criticisms. Commenters suggested she had perished in pursuit of fame. Some incorrectly surmised that she'd been hiking wearing only a bikini, although she was very under-equipped for the weather, which likely caused her death. Headlines across the world reported her death as Taiwan's glamorous bikini climber. Even though she was a very experienced mountain climber, Gigi Wu was considered to be in with a subset of social media risk-takers who have died chasing clout, and with the hundreds more people around the world who have perished mid-selfie over the past decade. The Taiwanese government weighed in as well, threatening to fine Gigi's mother $60,000 because her daughter had been hiking on an unsanctioned trail when helicopters and a cadre of climbers were marshaled to save her. In the end, Gigi's climbing friends intervened and the government relented. Many people attended Gigi Wu's funeral, many of them hikers who'd traveled from far corners of the island to stand in a room overstuffed with mourners. After Wu's cremation, friends placed her ashes in a small box, which they deposited into a shallow hole under the shade of a fir tree in a southeast New Taipei city cemetery. A small stone, largely indistinguishable from others around it, would mark her grave in the most pristine portion of a vast burial ground carved into a hillside and often blanketed by mist in the winter. For Lisala Folau, the will to survive would be one of the greatest stories ever told. Early in the morning, the volcano produced a colossal explosion that triggered a 7.4 magnitude earthquake. A shockwave radiated outward at close to the speed of sound, eventually traveling halfway around the world, and is listed as the loudest sound ever recorded. A tsunami quickly followed that hit Tonga Tapu, the main island in Tonga, and home to the capital, Nukualofa. Communications were knocked out as the streets began to flood and people fled for their lives. Lisala Folau lived on the small island of Atata, which is about five miles northwest of Tonga's capital. When I heard the loud bangs, I went outside my house. I thought it was thunder at first, but then I heard people chattering about getting to higher ground, Folau said. Atata boasts just one village with a population of about 70 people. The island's interior consists of high cliffs, which can provide protection against the tsunami. Not long after the eruption Saturday night, Mr. Folau's older brother managed to alert him that a tsunami wave was coming. At this time, Folau was painting in his house. Formerly a carpenter, Folau was disabled, causing both his legs to not properly function. I believe a baby can walk faster than I, Lisala stated. With a nephew, Lisala's brother helped him climb a tree. As waves crashed through the house, the Folau brothers and Lisala's niece, Elisiva, and nephew were in a tree and survived the first wave. During a lull in the waves, Lisala's brother told him and Elisiva to stay on the tree while he and his nephew sought help from the houses on higher grounds and to find some youth to help him to that area. Unbeknownst to the impending danger, his niece jumped down from the tree and attempted to get help as well and followed them. When she arrived, the nephew was tasked to assist an elderly woman while she was tasked to go back and assist Lisala to higher ground. It was a hard task for Elisiva, as it was getting cold and Lisala could barely move. At this time, it was around 7 p.m., Lisala's older brother was running, yelling to them that a big wave was coming. As Lisala turned and looked at the wave, it was a bigger wave than the previous 20-foot wave. When the wave break on land just below us, my niece Elisiva and I had nothing to hold on to, and we were swept out to sea, Lisala stated. Out into the dark, the pair floated out to sea, calling out to each other. But it was dark, and neither was visible. He eventually couldn't hear his niece, though he did hear his son calling for him from shore. The truth is, no son can abandon his father, Folau said. But for me, as a father, I kept my silence, for if I answered him, he would have jumped in and tried to rescue me. But I understand the tough situation, and I thought if the worst comes, it only comes to me. He continued floating, being bashed by large waves. His mindset was to grab onto a tree or anything that could help him survive, and he found one. 
This tree was Lisala's lifeline for the night in the open ocean. Folau spent the entire night struggling to stay afloat. If there was any silver lining from this devastating eruption, volcanic ash rain heated the ocean significantly, keeping him warm. He felt ash falling and his hair was full of ash and rocks. Staying afloat was the biggest ordeal, and Lisala was struggling. But his will to live distracted any feeling of thirst or exhaustion. Lisala wanted to live and find his family. The current carried Lisala to a tiny atoll called Tokatok, an uninhabited island around 7 a.m. Sunday morning. This island was less than three acres. It was almost bare. The tsunami stripped away most of the trees. He saw a police patrol boat heading to Atata, prompting him to grab a rag and wave toward it. He remained unseen. He was beside himself not knowing what happened to his family. This gave him a burst of energy and decided to swim to the island of Poloa. He began his swim, back into the ocean at about 10 a.m. Miraculously, Lisala made the eight-hour, four-mile swim to the island. When he made it ashore, called and yelled for help, but there was no one there. This was another uninhabited island. He was worried about his niece at this time and looked frantically for any sign of her. He felt another burst of energy as his concerns went to his sister with diabetes and his youngest daughter who has heart problems. Most would stay put and wait in hope for rescue. In a survival situation of this nature, this would be the correct and best decision to stay alive. But Lisala wasn't worried about the danger he is going to put himself in. He made the decision to swim to Sopu, on the western edge of Nukualofa, on the main island of Tongatapu, a 1.5 mile swim. All these thoughts were racing in my mind and what was the point now? I have survived, but what about them, he said. This drove me to get to Sopu. So back in the ocean, Lisala Folau went for a grueling swim, fueled by love, grief, and the will to survive and see his family again. At about 9 p.m., after more than five miles of swimming in the open ocean, Lisala Folau, the 57-year-old disabled grandfather, made it to the main island, an incredible feat an Olympic swimmer would struggle with. He swam ashore on a beach near a home in Sopu. He later found a piece of timber he used as a walking stick, eventually flagging down a vehicle and explaining that he was washed away from a Tata and was trying to contact his family. The driver of the vehicle took Folau to his village and told them who he was. The people of the village were stunned. Later on, Folau arrived at a relative's home on Tongatapu, where his evacuated family was staying. They were overjoyed to see him alive. They were planning his funeral and had told his wife, who was in Australia at the time he was dead, my family stayed up all night singing hymns because I had miraculously survived, Lisala stated. When the story of Lisala Folau reached the news, his incredible story captivated people the world over. His story went viral on social media, hailing him as a real-life Aquaman. Lisala would later give an interview to recount the miraculous survival story. The scariest part to me during the ordeal was when the waves took me from land into the sea, he said. What came into my mind when I was helpless at sea were two things. One is that I still had faith in God. Two is my family. I thought about my family and what they were thinking. They probably assumed I was dead. I have faith in my God and I left everything to the will of God and his plans for me. And if he wants me to live to see my family, it is up to him. I give praise and glory to God because he gave me the opportunity to see my family again. The people of Atata were relocated and resettled to the main island of Tongatapu, as their island was devastated by tsunami waves caused by the eruption and remained vulnerable to future tsunamis and cyclones. Unfortunately, there's not much information on the death toll on Atata, or if all of Lisala's family survived. The settlement for the Atata people opened on December 20, 2022. Many of the people of Atata lived a simple, subsistence lifestyle reliant on their renowned fishing skills. But now, they must adapt to a new life on the main island. This adjustment has been challenging for some. I really want to go back, Lisala Folau said, but I know it's a foolish thing to do because I would be putting myself and my family at risk. For David and Charlie Finlayson, their Idaho wilderness adventure would be a disaster. David Finlayson raised his son Charlie with the confidence that he would be a capable and dependable adventure partner by introducing him to backcountry pursuits from the mountains of Canada to the jungles of Panama as a child. 
Charlie has been in the backcountry with David since he was six months old. I know there were times that I had frozen mother's milk with me backpacking and climbing in Canada and different places, David said. So Charlie started climbing with his father as soon as he could. Charlie has been in mountains and jungles from Canada to South America to Europe since childhood. But in 2015, David was a rising eighth grader who mostly lived with his mom and stepdad. In the summer, Charlie spent a lot of time with his father climbing and exploring the mountains. We had been climbing crags around here in Salt Lake City for quite a while, and he wanted to climb something much more technical and complex, David said. In August of 2015, David and Charlie planned a two-week backpacking trip in Frank Church River of No Return Wilderness. With these types of expeditions, you have to carry all of your climbing gear. For the father-son duo, they carried roughly 100 pounds or 45 kilograms of gear. They headed to near the Salmon River to climb the Bighorn Crags. Four days into the father-son expedition and around 13 miles into the no-return wilderness, the two decided to camp at Ship Island Lake to scout out their planned climbs. We're not at the main campground, we're off the trail just camping in a place where we can easily get to the Bighorn Crags. The Bighorn Crags are this big cirque, I don't even know how my dad found out about it. There aren't any climbs set there, but we decided to make some, Charlie said. The Bighorn Crags, with their granite spires and jagged fins, have been called its crown jewel. There's little to no developed rock climbing in the area, but boundless potential for first ascents. Being 13 years old, Charlie was handling the expedition very competently. The two scouted out some climbs, about 1.5 miles or 2 miles of boulder fields and steep slabs and scree to get up to the walls where the granite towers were. They completed the balanced rock climb, which was an amazing experience for the father-son team, and bonded more than they already were. Feeling good about how the expedition is going, they scouted out a little more difficult climb they called the Twin Towers. It was here where disaster struck. On day seven of the two-week trip, no one was expecting them to come home early. David and Charlie started up the Twin Towers route early in the morning. It's a fairly easy pitch starting off for experienced climbers. It's a lot of fun, especially because I'm 13. I'm not really prepared to do anything too difficult, Charlie said. Charlie and David made it about 10 pitches, about 1,200 feet or 365 meters. Charlie was anchored to a tree that was coming out of the cliff off the route. David making his way back over to the route and didn't have any gear placed because he was making his way back across this ledge about 50 feet. Charlie is relaxed, belaying his dad with a grigri, which is the safer option for belaying for this climb. On a multi-pitch climb like this one, Two climbers will tie into opposite ends of the same rope and take turns belaying one another. A Grigri is a popular model of belay device that uses an assisted braking mechanism. If a climber falls, the device will lock up, arresting the rope. And that's when I hear him yell out, Charlie said. I don't know if I happened to dislodge something up above me or just was in the wrong place at the wrong time, but I heard a crack and then I got hit by the rock fall that was coming down, David said. Charlie looks over and his dad is in the air, and the boulder that he was standing on is also in the air. He was wrapped around the boulder with his feet and hands. The boulder was the size of two refrigerators stuck together. Charlie jumps down on solid ground to hold the rope against him as hard as he could so that when he falls, he doesn't fall with him. So they both don't fall 1,200 or 365 meters down. David hung on the rope 50 feet or 15 meters below Charlie, but from his perch on the ledge, Charlie couldn't see his dad. I know that he's there because there's dead weight on the rope. I can't hear him at all. He's either unconscious or headless. I don't know. But he's hanging down and I'm yelling out like, Dad, Dad. Nothing. Not a single answer. My mind's racing. I'm pretty neurotic, but at the same time, in emergency situations, I can process things a little bit better. So when he had fallen, I was panicking so much, which is weird to say, Charlie said. He knew that if his dad was alive, he had to do anything to get him down. He had the presence of mind to understand freaking out is not going to help the situation. I dropped down below him 50 or 60 feet. So when I woke up, I just saw a trail of blood going down the cliff wall. Charlie was yelling for me. I remember he was yelling pretty loudly and pretty upset. I think he was crying a bit. And once he found out that I was awake and I was okay, he got himself together pretty fast, David said. Lower the pack down, David yells. He was referring to the backpack with a first aid kit, water, food, and many other supplies for their expedition. 
David's left arm was shattered all the way from his elbow to his hand. He wasn't sure if he had his leg still attached. From his perspective, it looked like his leg was missing. But it turned out he shattered his leg, almost taking it off from his knee down. His foot was crushed as well. The bone was sticking out. He couldn't breathe, so he suspected his ribs were broken. His helmet was crushed into his head. David was in a very bad situation, dangling in the void, 1,200 feet above. Charlie lowered the first aid kit to his father, and David proceeded to patch himself up as much as he could. He was able to put a tourniquet on his leg. At his point, David was just trying to stay conscious. David, his body broken, dangled over a thousand feet or 300 meters off the ground. They were in a remote cirque over a mile from camp and more than a dozen miles from the trailhead. We had not seen anybody come into the Bighorn Crag, so I was pretty concerned about what would happen if I didn't make it and how Charlie was going to get out. I really didn't know how we were gonna make it down. We were up too high. Charlie knew how to set up an anchor to repel from and he knew how to do things like that, David said. Charlie was competent in lowering David but had no idea how they were going to make it down, deep in the back country without David bleeding out. While Charlie was a very good climber for his age, at 13 he was still not as experienced or likely had the strength to navigate this disaster. I had repelled while we were climbing but I had never set up a repel. Thankfully that trip we had practiced a little bit. He had shown me how to set it up, and so this was trial by fire. I'm looking at the dead tree hoping that thing's gonna anchor me. All I could see was this bush obstructing everything off the ledge from my view, and I'm just lowering myself through a bush and then I come out on the other side of the bush and my dad is below me and I rappel down to him. He's barely on a ledge and I see his injuries. So the helmet cracked, destroying his face. The whole left side of his face is just gashed open like his whole cheek, all of the skin gone. His left arm was just gnarly like broken. His left heel flipped around. His left foot was just completely shot. And the scariest thing to me was just his shin. His left shin was gone, Charlie said. Although it was midday in summer, David and Charlie were concerned about losing daylight. They knew that because of their position in the cirque, the sun would slip behind the mountains around 4.30 p.m. and leave them in a shadow. With no time to think about how to traverse down, they had to get out of this situation fast. Charlie wrapped up his dad's arm and tried to make a splint which didn't work because it was pulverized. Together, the father and son planned how they were going to make it out. If I pass out and you can't wake me up, then you need to lower yourself down, David said. He explained to Charlie how to get down and back to his truck and drive it if there was nobody there, as well as how to get out to get some kind of a rescue. David was in and out of consciousness while Charlie lowered him pitch by pitch all day long. They're racing the clock. There are three pitches left and the sun is setting. David is cold and shivering. The first sign of hypothermia is setting in. He had lost so much blood that hypothermia was coming on fast. The heat of the sun had vanished. About 300 feet or 90 meters from the ground, David was becoming delirious. That was when I realized I was 13 years old and my dad was not going to help out as much as I thought he was because he was mentally impaired. And so that definitely scared me, Charlie said. Charlie and David had descended hundreds of feet but were still far above the ground when Charlie realized that he was on his own. His dad was still alive and conscious, but it was clear that the pain or loss of blood from his extensive injuries was causing him to hallucinate. Charlie had had much experience setting up climbing gear before, but this was trial by fire, and he was succeeding. Just at the right time, as his dad's life was totally in his hands. In the darkness, lowering the dead weight of his father, Charlie and David finally made it down. It was late evening at this point. Even with the safety of being off the cliff, the Finlayson still had a mile or 1.6 kilometers of boulder field to traverse between them and base camp. David knew he wouldn't be able to make it in the dark, if at all. David tells Charlie to go sleep at the camp, trying to save his son from seeing him in excruciating pain. But Charlie refuses, and they had an argument about it. But in the end, Charlie agrees to go back to camp to get supplies. I go back to the camp all the way down to the boulder field and I stuffed two sleeping bags and a bunch of granola bars. I don't even think I got sleeping pads. I didn't think to get that. I got water, so I have food and water. I get some more first aid gear so we can patch him up and I have stuff to sleep, so I head back up, Charlie said. After patching his dad up, David ate a granola bar, drank some water, and the night began. David adjusted his bandages every hour. 
letting the wombs bleed and taping it back up. Charlie stayed up with his dad all night while he was shivering, staring at the stars, trying to stay conscious. They were wedged between boulders, so the area wasn't flat, which made for uncomfortable rest. But David made it through the night. The sun arose, and now the difficult task of traversing the boulder field with only one good limb, his right arm. He has a broken foot, a destroyed leg, a broken arm, and a broken back, and he's just shimming along these boulders. It's a mile of boulder field, and he's picking himself up with his right arm, moving to the next boulder. I'm just carrying this stuff with me and then trying to help him sometimes, but it doesn't help that much, Charlie said. Charlie couldn't carry his dad, so he became his dad's coach. He would make it six inches at a time, pass out. Charlie wakes David up and continues crawling over the boulders. The pain was unbearable. But David knew his only chance of survival was making it to camp. But it was looking bleak if he would make it. We'd be going along and he would say, Hey, Charlie, I don't think that I can make it. I think that you should go out. Just find someone to help. And if they can find me on the boulder field, great. But I don't think I can go farther. And I remember that. I was like, no, you have to get to camp. I don't think that people will find you on the boulder field. It's so big. You have to at least get to camp, Charlie said. He would find the easiest routes for his dad to make it over. Six inches at a time, Charlie kept motivating his dad, letting him know he could do it. This went on for hours. When things looked insurmountable, David looked to his son for strength. He didn't want to let him down or watch him die. After six grueling hours, the Finlayson make it to the edge of the boulder field. With only a few feet left, Charlie decides to run back to camp for some food to aid in his final stretch to the camp. Unfortunately, it wouldn't be that easy. In the distance, Charlie hears his dad yell out. David fell, hit the ground, and caught himself with his broken left arm and fainted. Somehow, Charlie was able to pick his dad back up. He was fainting every 15 seconds, slumping on his son, then waking back up, then losing consciousness yet again. But miraculously, they made it back to camp. Charlie gets his dad in the tent, wraps him in the sleeping bag, made some food, and contemplated what to do next. It had been just about 24 hours since David's accident. There was some daylight left, but neither Charlie nor David would be able to make it to the trailhead that day. So Charlie makes a trek around the lake they were camped to the main campground in the area to see if he could find help. When Charlie arrives, he looks around. No people, no tents. Charlie yells out, no response, no other campers in the area. Charlie is devastated. The nearest campground is four miles away and that wasn't an option. He was not going to leave his father. So fueled by love, fear, and adrenaline, Charlie runs a complete loop around the lake, hoping to find someone with no luck. A few hours later, he makes it back to his father where he proceeds to wash his shin, clean out his wound, and patch it up again. He's still losing blood, but not as much now. There's just no way I can move anymore and you're gonna have to hike out and get rescue, David said. Charlie didn't like that option. I had never hiked alone anywhere and I did not want to leave him alone. We didn't know if anybody was coming to this lake that we could tell to be with him. And so I'm praying, I'm trying to find some way that maybe we could get around this and I'm just distraught. We're so far away from anyone. Everyone thinks we have a week left of the trip. He'll be dead before anyone comes looking for us, Charlie said. Charlie weighed his options. They had no cell service, no satellite phone or SOS device, and there were no other campers to be found. So he knew what he had to do. So it was decided Charlie would hike out in the morning to find rescue. David had lost so much blood at this point that he knew death was around the corner. He didn't want his son to witness the pain, agony, and traumatizing experience of watching his father die a slow and painful death. He wanted Charlie out of there. David knew his chances of survival were slim when Charlie was gone. But as a father, he knew this would be a traumatizing ordeal for his son to go through and wanted him far away. Before Charlie hit the trail the following morning, David armed him with a note torn out of a hiking guidebook that he could hand off to the first person he found to help, which read, This is my son, Charlie. I've been hurt in a climbing accident. We're at the southwest end of the Ship Island Lake, or I am. Could you please help him? David gave Charlie a map of the lake and the wilderness they were in and drew where he was located on the map. At 8 a.m. the next morning, Charlie packed his backpack with the essentials. A sleeping bag, the keys to the car, a few granola bars, a water bottle, a water filter, and some energy pouches. The plan was for him to be away from him for a day. Charlie knew that it wasn't going to be easy for David to care for his wounds or make food. He was stuck in the tent, 
So if something happened to me, leaving him was death for him, and I didn't trust myself to make it out, really. I did not want to leave him, just knowing that this might be the last time I see him. So I had that note, and I had the map, and that's when we said our goodbyes. It was a hard goodbye. That was when I started hiking here around 8.15. I started praying again. I was just hauling, trying to get out, find someone, Charlie said. For the first few miles, as Charlie climbed out of the lake basin, he saw no one. He was starting to get worried and was considering heading back to his dad. But Charlie knew he had to forge on. It was the only chance for his dad to live. A few miles into his hike, Charlie heard something. It sounded like people talking. Hastily, Charlie sprints toward the voices when he comes upon another father-son duo, the Craigs. By pure happenstance, they were from the same hometown and also LDS members as he. But he didn't know them personally. He gives the Craigs the note. They informed Charlie there was a scout troop at the next lake, which was maybe two miles farther. The Craigs make the trek to where David is camped. Charlie runs to the next lake to find the troop. The Craigs arrived and David was relieved, not just because he knew he was saved, but because he knew Charlie was okay. Meanwhile, Charlie is jogging to the other lake where the Craigs told him the troop was. A sense of relief came over Charlie knowing people knew where his dad was. I'm glad they were there to just be there for him. I got to the next lake that they had told me about, and I think that the scout troop had just left. So I'm about to start on the trail again when I feel like, okay, you just need to pray again. So I pray right before leaving the lake, and God answers, he honestly did. I was about to hike away from the lake and keep going along the trail when I felt a distinct feeling that I shouldn't. Even though there wasn't a person in sight, I should just blow my whistle as hard as I could. I was probably blowing my whistle for three to five minutes, and this guy just comes running out of the woods. It was an answer straight from God, Charlie said. The hiker who heard Charlie's whistle had been camping at a hidden lake with his family. Charlie told him this story, and the man, luckily enough, said he was a marathon runner. He offered to run to the ranger station while Charlie made his way behind him. It was eight miles to the ranger station, and when Charlie arrived a few hours behind the runner in the late afternoon, a rescue was already underway. They had already dispatched a helicopter, and the rangers gave him a grilled cheese sandwich as he waited for his stepdad to pick him up. David was flown to Salmon, Idaho, and then to Boise, where he'd undergo his first rounds of surgeries. His leg was severely damaged and couldn't receive the help he needed and was flown to a Salt Lake City hospital. I don't know how many surgeries I've had, 10 or 12 surgeries putting me back together. I think they rebuilt my leg and my arm three or four times each. And they had an experimental program in Salt Lake City at the IMC Medical Center for rebuilding tissue. So I went through months of, they actually rebuilt a new leg for me out of bovine tissue. It's a stem cell thing that they did and rebuilt the tissue in my leg and then reattached all the tendons and ligaments. And I had basically a big metal cage for a while, everything healed and then three or four surgeries trying to put that together, David said. David's brain injury ended his career as a trial attorney and decided to live life like he always wanted. As a nomad, he had a cabin in a backcountry where he lived. He sold it and now travels and where he continues to climb, play guitar and meditate. The story of the Finlaysons made national news and Charlie was heralded as a hero. In typical Charlie fashion, he was very modest about his newfound fame. He told reporters that anyone could have done what he did. His parents begged to differ. Growing up, Charlie felt as if he lived a sort of dual life, one with his mom and stepdad and the other with his dad and the climbing adventures together. I didn't feel like the same person when I was with my mom as I was when I was with my dad. I don't know how connected I felt to either of them, especially my dad, but through this experience, I feel like we really did make a connection, Charlie said. David felt the same connection with his son, a 13-year-old son that saved his life. A life and death situation will always bond human beings. Charlie would never be the same again, and David will forever be a proud father of how his son handled the ordeal, which many people, regardless of age, would panic. Charlie showed poise and held together when the situation looked dire. It created something in him that really gave him a sense of being, a stronger connection to the mountains and nature. Rather than scaring him away from it, Charlie Finlayson continued to climb. The Finlayson, with Charlie being a 21-year-old student at BYU, still climbs together and shares an unbreakable bond, forged together even more by the traumatic incident in the Idaho wilderness. Charlie says, that experience was a milestone in our relationship as a dad and as a son. 
And you would think that I would just be like, I'm never climbing again. But I actually felt safer. I knew that in a situation like that, first of all, I could respond logically, not emotionally, in a way that would aid the situation. I also knew that my father and I could look out for each other like we were there for each other until death. He was going to do everything that he could to make sure I was safe, and I was not going to let him die against all odds. For Dean Potter, his base jump would be a disaster. Dean Potter, an American adventurer, was a remarkable figure in the world of extreme sports. He excelled in free climbing, alpinism, base jumping, and highlining, achieving numerous difficult first ascents, free solo ascents, speed ascents, and enchainments in Yosemite National Park in Patagonia. Standing at an impressive six foot five and weighing 180 pounds, he was larger than life. Potter was not content with conventional thrills. He pushed the boundaries by inventing free base a hair-raising act that involved free soloing with a parachute. He also pioneered untethered highlining and mastered base jumping. His life was a true adventure, and he made a significant impact on the world of extreme sports. Born in 1972 and raised in New Hampshire, Dean Potter discovered his passion for climbing during his years in southern New Hampshire. His first foray into climbing happened on the granite cliffs of Joe English Hill, a towering one. 273-foot mountain near a local military base. Breaking the rules, he embarked on a solo climb, wearing nothing but his Converse All-Stars. This bold act marked the beginning of his adventurous climbing journey and showcased his fearless approach to the sport. While attending the University of New Hampshire, Potter's passion for climbing grew, but he couldn't resist his calling. Leaving university at the age of 20, he fully committed himself to climbing leading him to become a highly influential figure in the free-spirited and countercultural roots of rock climbing during the 21st century. During the 90s, Potter embarked on a nomadic journey, living a rough and minimalist lifestyle even by dirtbag standards. He relied on food stamps, salt sandwiches, and condiments to survive while spending years in his van or couch surfing. Moving between the boulders of Hueco tanks and the red cracks of Moab, he left behind a trail of challenging first ascents and worked temporary dead-end jobs. Potter's climbing legacy spans the landscapes of the United States, South America, and Europe, but it was in Yosemite Valley where his climbing career truly flourished. In 1993, he arrived in Yosemite and crossed paths with the legendary slacklining pioneer, Chongo Chuck. From Chuck, Potter learned about the gritty dirtbag lifestyle and was introduced to slacklining which became an essential part of his climbing skills. Over the following decades, Potter became a prominent figure in Yosemite's climbing community, especially during the late 90s and early 2000s. His audacious ascent, solo climbs, and record-breaking achievements made him stand out among fellow climbers. His fearless approach and innovative techniques left a lasting impact on the sport, particularly within the iconic cliffs and crags of Yosemite Valley. Inspired by Yosemite legends, Potter set his sights on speed records and big wall link-ups. In 1986, Peter Croft and Jim Bridwell set the bar with their 24-hour link-up of Half Dome and El Capitan, showcasing the possibilities of the number of pitches a climber could attempt in a single day. The concept of the Triple Crown, a one-day link-up of Half Dome, El Capitan, and Mount Watkins, remained unrealized until Dean Potter and Timmy O'Neill took on the challenge. Their grueling journey involved 71 pitches, most climbed free except for some tougher sections. They successfully completed the first Triple Crown link-up after scaling 7,000 feet or 2,100 meters and miles of hiking on approach trails. In 2001, Dean Potter entered the fiercely competitive arena for the nose speed record, a prestigious title in the world of rock climbing. Alongside Timmy O'Neill, he attempted the nose on El Capitan, completing the route in an impressive three hours and 59 minutes breaking the previous record set by Hans Florin and Peter Croft, which had stood at four hours and 31 minutes. Another significant achievement was Potter's second ascent of the notoriously challenging route on Half Dome known as Southern Bell. It had not been successfully repeated since its first free ascent in 1988 by Dave Schultz and Scott Cosgrove, a span of over 18 years. With its sparse protection, Southern Bell remains one of the most dangerous climbs in Yosemite and Potter acknowledged the high risk involved. On a fair bit of the upper ground, if you fall, 
You might as well be dead, he said. Potter's most awe-inspiring and controversial climbs were his free solo endeavors throughout his career. He achieved numerous impressive free solo first ascents and introduced the concept of free base, solo climbing with a parachute as a last resort safety measure. One such iconic ascent was Separate Reality, a route he soloed five times consecutively, leaving a profound mark on climbing history. In addition to that, he tackled the challenging route, A Dog's Roof, one of the hardest free solos attempted in Yosemite, just days after his Separate Reality feat. Potter's achievements continue to be celebrated in the climbing community, leaving an unforgettable legacy in the world of extreme sports. When reflecting on his significant climbing achievements, Potter often mentioned his experiences in Argentina in 2002. It was a memorable season in Patagonia, where daring solo ascents were at their peak. In the Fitzroy Massif, Potter completed the first solo ascent of Super Canaleta, a demanding 1,600-foot or 490-meter route. Embracing a light-is-right approach, he took on this challenging climb with minimal gear, a quart of water, and no warm clothing. Setting off before dawn, he navigated the treacherous ice and granite, reaching the summit in an impressive six and a half hours. Not long after, Potter climbed Cerro Torre via the compressor route in just eight and a half hours, facing an unexpected storm that left him seeking shelter in an ice cave with only a tin foil survival blanket for warmth. Only a little over a week later, Potter returned to the Fitzroy Massif for a record-breaking first ascent on a route he would later name Californian Roulette. This 7,100-foot or 2,100-meter route on Fitzroy's southwest side had claimed the lives of several climbers attempting it before. After a grueling 10-hour climb to the summit, tragedy struck as a falling toaster-sized boulder hit Potter's leg, causing him to black out. Despite severe injuries and perilous conditions, he embarked on a critical 36-hour descent, a survival situation of the highest risk in his climbing career. This experience motivated Potter to explore base jumping as a safer and more efficient way to descend from mountains, leading to a new chapter in his adventurous journey. One of the most contentious moments in Dean Potter's climbing career occurred during his free solo ascent of the Delicate Arch in Arches National Park, Utah. This climb triggered widespread controversy within the climbing community, leading to heated debates and criticism from friends and mentors. It even resulted in Potter losing sponsorship from two major companies, Patagonia and Black Diamond. Potter had been eyeing the 60-foot or 20-meter arch for over 12 years, and on May 6, 2006, he began working on it. He meticulously studied every feature in detail on the arch, but a fixed line had to be set up before attempting the free solo. This would allow him to practice and be recorded from above. The method used to set up the fixed line remains a mystery, as neither Potter nor Brad Lynch, his partner, revealed it. Potter is believed to have climbed the arch a total of six times. Despite claiming to adhere to a strict leave-no-trace approach, some critics alleged that up to five rope grooves were left behind. In response, Potter defended himself, stating that the marks were not his. Others had been on the arch. Though climbing the arch wasn't technically illegal at the time, the backlash from Potter's ascent led to climbing bans throughout the park. These bans prevented new routes from being established in Arches National Park, significantly changing its climbing regulations. In 2008, Potter's solo ascent of the 1,000-foot or 300-meter deep blue sea on the north face of the Eiger was not only one of the most impressive achievements of his career, but also the testing ground for his innovative creation, Freebase. The slightly overhanging limestone face of the Eiger provided the perfect environment for Potter to refine this new discipline, which allowed for the freedom of soloing with a safety parachute, minimizing the risk of instantaneous death. Spending the climbing season in Switzerland, Potter honed his base jumping skills and pushed his limits on the challenging limestone routes. Reflecting on the experience, he acknowledged, free base climbing the deep blue sea has stirred my way of thinking more than anything in the past. After his groundbreaking ascent on the Eiger, Dean Potter returned to Yosemite Valley, bringing the honed freebase skills he acquired in Switzerland. He applied this innovative approach to the iconic walls of Yosemite, resulting in remarkable ascents. Among his most notable achievements was his solo climb of the Rostrum, a towering 1,400-meter pillar, first free soloed by Peter Croft in 1985. 
Potter took the challenge to a new level by repeating the rostrum ascent and soloing the alien roof finish. An even more challenging feat, considered the hardest long solo attempted in the valley. Before Alex Honnold's groundbreaking free solo of Freerider, Dean Potter made significant progress in soloing El Capitan. Although not a complete free solo, Potter's partial ascent was a major milestone in El Capitan's free soloing history. He started from the top of El Capitan, down climbed the slabby upper pitches of Lurking Fear, traversed the Thanksgiving ledge, and finished the last six pitches of Freerider. Potter named this route Easy Rider, allowing him to bypass the technically challenging slab section at the start of Freerider. While not the first true free solo of El Capitan, his ascent undoubtedly contributed to the progression of free soloing on this iconic wall. Apart from his climbing achievements, Dean Potter was a pioneering figure in the world of slacklining. He attributed much of his climbing success to the skills developed through slacklining, which improved his balance, focus, and body awareness, qualities essential for navigating difficult climbing routes. Recognizing its benefits, the climbing community quickly embraced slacklining as a valuable training tool. In 2003, Potter achieved another milestone when he became the second person to highline the Lost Arrow Spire untethered, completing both the uphill and downhill versions. This extraordinary feat showcased his exceptional balance and fearlessness. Considering the Lost Arrow Spire's daunting 2,700-foot or 800-meter vertical rock formation in Yosemite National Park, another memorable moment in Potter's slacklining career was the famous moonwalk at Cathedral Peak. The image of Potter, silhouetted against the moonlit sky as he traversed the High Line, has reached a near legendary status, cementing his status as a trailblazer in the world of slacklining. Upon discovering base jumping at the age of 30, Dean Potter, true to his adventurous nature, immediately began pushing the boundaries of the sport. Within a year of starting his base jumping career, he encountered a life-threatening incident at the Cave of Swallows near Mexico City. His parachute malfunctioned during a 1,200-foot or 365-meter jump, leaving him hurtling toward the ground with no protection. In a split-second decision, just 200 feet from the cave floor, Potter managed to grab a 10-millimeter rope used by other jumpers to climb out. Clutching the rope tightly, he crash-landed in the cave, miraculously surviving the fall, but sustaining severe hand injuries with deep rope burns in both palms. Despite this harrowing experience, Potter continued to push the limits of base jumping, becoming one of the leading base jumpers in the Americas. He also became a vocal advocate for legalizing base jumping in national parks. In 2011, Potter set a new record for the longest wingsuit flights ever recorded, by flying 4.6 miles or 7.5 kilometers off the north face of Iger. However, disaster struck on May 16, 2015, in Yosemite Valley. Standing with his partner Graham Hunt, his girlfriend Jen Rapp, and their dog Whisper at the edge of Taft Point, they looked down 3,000 feet or 900 meters above the famous Green Valley with the sunset on the horizon. Knowing that base jumping was illegal in national parks, especially in Yosemite, where the majestic cliffs make it a prime location, Potter and Hunt still jumped numerous times. They were familiar with the route, and despite the risks, they decided to take the leap. Taft Point is usually off-limits, marked with railings to protect tourists, but the thrill-seeking pair preferred jumping from a spot about 100 yards west. They would descend hundreds of feet with arms and legs spread, their wingsuits filling with air until falling turned into soaring through the air they would fly right toward the heart of the valley. There is a sloping rib of a ridge there, a relatively unremarkable feature called Lost Brother. It is not marked on the park maps handed to visitors. It juts downward into the valley before abruptly ending into a vertical wall known mostly to climbers. In that ridge is a notch shaped like a V. Potter and Hunt had made the jump many times, sometimes together, sometimes not. Hunt had done it without Potter several days before. He would usually steer himself through the notch. Potter had been through the notch several times, but usually went around the ridge to the left. It depended on how well they maintained altitude once they began to fly. The men were zipped into their suits. They did not wait for the full cloak of dust. A breeze from behind caught their attention, but did not send a strong enough warning to pause. It was 7.25 p.m. on May 16th. Potter jumped and hunt soon after. Jen Rapp clicked photographs. 
The men fell out of the frame before her lens caught them falling away, soaring with wings spread. Hunt quickly passed Potter. His suit was made for speed. Potter had set records for long flights and preferred loft. He had been in Canada working on a design to allow him to land on his belly on glacial ice with no parachute necessary. He's low, Jen thought to herself. Why is he going toward the notch? She saw Hunt veer left as if to go around the ridge, then quickly back to the right. Potter held his line for the notch. They disappeared into the hole that led to the dusky valley. Rap heard a thwap. Her mind tried to tell her it was the familiar sound of a parachute deploying. It was followed almost immediately by a duller, heavier sound. Rap waited alone on the cliff's edge for more clues from below. None came. She clicked through her camera to retrace the flight paths in the photos. In two dimensions, without depth perception, it was hard to tell what happened to the shrinking specks in the frames. There was Hunt, who disappeared into the grayness of the rocks. There was Potter, who made it through the leading edge of the notch, a downward halfpipe, and fell out of sight. Somewhere far below was Rebecca Haney, Hunt's girlfriend of a few months. She had been hiking when Hunt called, saying that he and Potter planned to jump at Taft Point, meet at the meadow at 7.30. She aborted her hike and went to the lodge area in Yosemite Valley to get a drink and pass the time. She did not see a text message that Hunt sent at 6.55 until about 7.25 because of spotty cellular service in Yosemite. He had asked her to turn on her two-way radio to communicate. She quickly texted back that she would in a few minutes. She drove around the darkening forested roads for 90 minutes, waiting to hear from Hunt again. I was putting my faith in a lot of irrational places, she said in a phone interview, even though I knew what probably happened. In the dwindling light, Rap rushed back up the trail to the parking lot. She drove her car the 13 miles or 20 kilometers back to Wawona Road, made a right, and headed down to the valley floor. She went to El Capitan Meadow, but there was no one there. Her phone had no text messages. Unsure of what to do or where to go, she drove to the rented house she and Potter shared in Yosemite West, a cluster of homes back up Wawona Road, past the Glacier Point turnoff. The couple recently bought 31 acres nearby and had plans to build their own home. That rainy and cool day had been spent clearing trees and brush, and Hunt was there to help until the clearing skies led to the idea of making an evening jump off Taft Point. Upon arriving at the dark and empty house, Jen's mind raced as she studied the photos and considered various scenarios. She wondered if the sounds she heard were Hunt crashing or if Potter had witnessed the accident and was searching for his friend. Perhaps Potter was hurt or maybe they were hiding from park rangers or had been arrested. Her thoughts were a mix of hope and worry, and she kept anticipating their return. Around 9.30 a car pulled up, and Haney stepped out alone. The two women drove back into the valley looking for familiar faces among climbers camping or hanging around the village in the bar, but found none. At about 10.30, they sought help from Mike Gauthier, Yosemite's chief of staff, who quickly called the Yosemite dispatcher to report the missing base jumpers. A late night search was initiated by rangers and volunteers from Yosemite Search and Rescue. As daybreak arrived, there were still no answers, and Jen felt helpless waiting. At 4 a.m., she decided to take binoculars and head to the base of the canyon below Lost Brother, hoping to spot any movement or color. She screamed into the darkness but received no response. As the helicopter took off in the morning, two bodies were quickly spotted. It was evident that neither man had deployed a parachute. Hunt had crashed into the right wall after clearing the base of the notch, while Potter was found several hundred feet farther into the notch. Speculation arose that the site of Hunt's accident or the air disturbance from his maneuvers might have affected Potter's concentration or control. Contrary to some news reports, neither man wore a GoPro video recorder, but Potter had jumped with a smartphone strapped to his head. Although the phone was heavily damaged, Park Service investigators hoped to find clues from it, along with Rapp's photos. The search for answers and understanding of the tragic event continued. Rapp returned to Taft Point three days after the accident. By then, there was a memorial at the cliff's edge, where Potter and Hunt had made their final jump. El Capitan sits across the valley a little to the left. Yosemite Falls can be seen a little to the right over the top of the brown, downsloping ridge with the notch. The memorial included feathers, a beer can, Tibetan prayer flags, and a photograph of Potter. There is little doubt that Potter's spirit will be felt in Yosemite and far beyond, 
thanks to the legendary legacy he carved out in his most extraordinary original way. Potter lived on the outer edge of extreme sports and perished in his beloved Yosemite National Park. The beauty of Yosemite inspired him to be the best possible artist, partner, father, and friend, Rap said. This is exactly where he'd want his rule-breaking, fringe-pushing, counterculture spirit to live forever. Dean Potter was a visionary in the climbing world, continually pushing the limits of human capability in free solo climbing, highlining, and base jumping. He explored new routes and techniques, inspiring others to think creatively and pursue their own boundaries. Potter's death was a stark reminder of the risks inherent in extreme sports, particularly base jumping. His passing prompted discussions about safety, risk management, and the importance of responsible decision-making in high-risk activities. During the memorial service, Jen Rapp sat alone on a rock. A raven appeared. Unflinchingly, it approached and patiently ate a piece of salami out of her hand. It had never happened to her before. The way the raven looked at me so intently, Rapp said, pausing as the thought drifted unfinished. Yeah, it was Dean. In an Instagram post three weeks before his death, Potter pondered how he had managed to survive all these years. He said he wanted to be free like a raven. Somehow, I've made a life of dipping my toes in icy water, feeling the lift of fresh, clean air and the pull of planets overhead, he wrote. Sure, I lack a lot, but it's equally for sure that I fly free. For one group of hikers, their Yosemite excursion would be one of the worst disasters in the park's history. Half Dome is a Yosemite icon and a great challenge to many hikers. Thousands of people reach the summit each year. For most, it is an exciting, arduous hike. For a few, it becomes more of an adventure than they wanted. Indeed, park rangers assist hundreds of people on the Half Dome Trail every summer. Much of the hike to Half Dome is an adventure into wilderness, and while there is nothing you can do to guarantee your safety, but that was the thrill co-workers and close friends Tom Rice and Adrian Esteban lived for. Regular outdoor companions Tom Rice and Adrian Esteban headed a party that would attempt the 16-mile round-trip hike to Summit Half Dome. Esteban had recruited another work friend Bill Pippi and his work supervisor Bob Frith to join. Frith in turn had invited his best friend Bruce Weiner. Both were East Coast transplants and have recently arrived in California. Bill Pippi invited 16-year-old twin brothers, Bruce and Brian Jordan. Rounding out the group was co-worker Carl Buckner, who in turn invited his best friend, Steve Elner. The Rice Esteban group awoke to a crystal clear summer sky, ready for a full day of hiking to conquer the famed granite monolith. The caravan entered Yosemite Valley. Being Bruce Weiner's first time, he was awestruck by Yosemite Valley. The monstrous granite cliffs towered high over the valley like looming giants. Entering Yosemite Valley is breathtaking as you gaze up at the mile sheer from the valley floor. Then there it was half dome and its distinct features. One side is a sheer face while the other three sides are smooth and round, making it appear like a dome cut in half. It's the star of the valley, towering nearly 5,000 feet from the valley floor. Weiner had difficulty visualizing himself atop the overpowering mountain and wondered silently if he could really accomplish such a feat. They had a buffet breakfast at the cafeteria at Camp Curry, then loaded their backpacks with gear, clothing and food. It was a two-mile march to the trailhead at Happy Isles. The sky was blue when the group headed out except for a single cumulus cloud floating above. By the time they reached Vernal Fall, a few cumuli of clouds had formed in the sky to the east. As the hike went on, Buckner and Elner fell behind and were a good 30 minutes behind the group. Rice, Esteban, Pippi and the Jordan twins were ahead. Frith and Weiner arrived shortly after. Around 12.30 p.m. to cool off after a rigorous first half of the hike, they dove into the chill water upriver from Nevada Fall. They hooted, shouted, and yelled obscenities while tussling like schoolboys to push each other off. All the while, several cumulus clouds in the eastern skies now had combined and were massing over and rumblings could be heard in the distance around Cloud's Rest. The threatening weather prompted Tom Rice and his party to pack up. Rice and Esteban assured the others once they were on the summit they would be safe and dry in the cave if a thunderstorm hit. Pippi and Bruce Jordan were setting a furious pace, hoping to outrace the coming storm. Close behind, 
Tom Rice and Adrian Esteban made a quick stop at their secret spring. Brian Jordan soon joined them. Back at Nevada Falls, Weiner and Frith were falling behind. Carrying a 45-pound backpack, they'd been behind the other five for most of the trip. As exhausted as they were, they plodded ahead anyways. But as they went on, Weiner's muscles began to cramp. They gulped the last of their water. Weiner wanted to take a longer rest, but Frith urged him to push on and catch up with the others. Bill Pippi and Bruce Jordan were shooting to reach the top first. Both were competitive and in good shape. So despite the intimidating weather, the two raced ahead. Unfortunately for Pippi, he had an undeniable sensation to relieve himself of feces, so they headed back to find a place for Pippi. Esteban, Rice, and Brian Jordan were not far behind. As they were ascending, two hikers coming down warned them not to go up as the storm was coming. Rather, the warning enticed them to pick up the pace and reach the summit. Buckner and Elner were still very far behind, but continued plodding along, even after the threat of the lightning storm. Well ahead of their companions, Esteban and Rice reached the bottom of the cables at 5.40 p.m. as the dark clouds blanketed the sky. Lightning continued playing over the ridges and spires and the thunder rumbled like battleship guns nearby. At the base of the cables, there's a sign warning hikers of ascending the mountain during a lightning storm. Half Dome is notorious for lightning strikes. Its smooth granite surface makes for an excellent conductor of electricity. They now had to weigh their next move. The threat of lightning would spur them on. At the top, they'd reach shelter in the form of a cave where they could hide from the storm. While a lightning bolt might possibly strike the granite slop near them, or even hit the cables they would be clinging to, a strike higher up was far more likely. What they didn't factor in was a strike could streak anywhere on wet surfaces. Any place on the mountain would be dangerous if Half Dome were coated with water. As Esteban looked up and analyzed the sky, he felt a drizzle on his face. Torrential rain wasn't far off. They figured this storm was no different from past hazards they have encountered over the years. The two exchanged a glance and knew the decision had been made. Screw it, this is our mountain, let's just do it, Rice said. Esteban agreed. Despite the looming storm and the warning, they forged on and ascended the cables 600 feet away from the summit, shrouded in mist. Rice moved rapidly toward the cables, with Esteban immediately behind him. As if cued by their movements, a mosaic of jagged lightning streaked the sky, followed by rolling claps. A sense of foreboding overtook Esteban, which prompted him to say, Whatever happens, I want you to know I love you. Meanwhile, Jordan split from the other group, content to hike at his own pace. Eager to impress the older men, he followed in Rice and Esteban's footsteps without a second thought. Further back were Firth and Weiner. The warning sign at the base of the subdome stared at them as they approached the cables. A concerned Weiner wondered aloud if they should stop and wait out the storm. Frith assured him that refuge was in a cave that awaited them at the summit. He doubted he could make it up but he figured his muscle would tighten further if he delayed further. As a newcomer, he didn't want to hold anyone back. They caught a glimpse of Rice and Esteban nearing the summit just as clouds unleashed pouring rain. Firth and Weiner put on their ponchos and began ascending the cables to the summit. As Rice and Esteban reached the summit around 6 p.m., they were still aware of their vulnerability. Lightning would strike the dome, it was only a matter of when. They dashed across the summit toward the cave. We made it! They yelled jubilantly and high-fived each other. Minutes later, they saw Brian Jordan standing at the summit. Esteban waved him urgently towards the cave. As Brian hustled over, Frith and Weiner appeared at the summit and waved them in as well. Bring on the lightning show, they yelled as they settled down in the cave. All were proud of what they had accomplished and were beaming with joy. At this time, the rain turned colder. Hailstones began clattering on the rocks. The five huddled inside the cave, looking to generate some heat. Meanwhile, Bill Pippi and Bruce Jordan had wisely stayed below Subdome after Bruce said he was afraid of the lightning storm. Pippi, now dehydrated and severely weakened from diarrhea, they decided to head to base camp where they pitched their tent and hunkered down at around 6.15 p.m. Back at the cave, the eerie lightning tracers glowed inside, casting ghostly hues. In an instant, the cave exploded with a cataclysmic roar as lightning ripped across its surfaces. Esteban was slammed against the wall. He screamed but didn't hear his voice. 
everything grew dark. He was numb and couldn't move. Electricity had entered his body. Because he had limited contact with the granite, had confined the charge to the left side of his body, and was lucky he didn't get the full effect of the strike. Weiner was also lucky, bending to adjust his laces. He was only touching the wall with his rear and thighs, but he had no feeling from the waist down and was moaning in pain. But he was the most coherent of the group. Weiner turned to look at Brian Jordan, whose eyes were vacant. In shock, he says, we've got to get out of here. Turning to scan the cave, he saw Rice slouch sideways against the granite wall in a fetal position with his body jerking and twitching. His bare legs were badly charred and his blonde hair was blackened. As Esteban came to, he looked over at Brian Jordan, slumped forward, smelling of burning flesh. He appeared lifeless. With sickening clarity, Esteban now saw that he and Rice put everyone at risk. Pulling himself with his paralyzed legs behind, he was horrified at what he saw. Firth was vomiting and froth, gurgling from his mouth, eyes rolled back and showing their whites. His forehead bore a gash as if someone had plunged a white-hot dagger into his skull. His body was thrashing and threatened to catapult himself off the ledge. Esteban managed to snag his waistband and pulled him back from the lip, but his body continued to convulse toward the edge as though he was seeking the void beyond. Esteban strained to hold on and yelled for help. Weiner, seeing his friend in peril, managed to grab Frith's sweater. Together, they pulled Frith back. But with both paralyzed from the waist down, they couldn't exert enough leverage. They couldn't control his violent convulsions and were in danger to go over the ledge as well. Weiner desperately held on as Esteban let go. Firth convulsing slid farther and was yanking Weiner closer to the edge as well. Weiner had no choice but to let go. In horror, he and Esteban watch as Firth disappeared over the precipice, to the rocks 2,200 feet below. Weiner screamed and began to sob. Devastated by the tragedy, Esteban looks over at Rice, whose left leg was twisted beneath a dislodged rock. He was making unintelligible noises and was gagging on regurgitated broccoli. He cleared his mouth and shook him in a vain attempt to restore consciousness. Severe burns scorched Rice's legs and were still smoking as atmospheric crackling sounded outside. Esteban was petrified and screamed to Weiner, we've to get the hell out of here. Weiner tried to stand but fell back down. Esteban was convinced they were in mortal peril and could only think of escape. With all his upper body strength, he crawled his way to the tunnel entrance and onto the summit. His sights were set on a crevice called the outhouse that was about 150 feet away. Crawling frantically, he reached the depression. Giddy with relief, Esteban blended tears with shrill laughter as he was alive. And for the moment, that was all that mattered. Back at the cave, Weiner was shaken to the core by the disaster that had befallen him and his companions. He could have mustered enough strength to scramble out of the cave, but getting down the cable with an immobilized leg was unthinkable, and he wanted no part of being out there on the bare summit as a human lightning rod. So he prayed another strike wouldn't happen and stayed put. Buzzing and crackling suddenly filled the air. He had no time to budge before another blinding explosion blasted the granite and ripped through the cave. Weiner immediately found himself floating as he was having an out-of-body experience, watching his body convulse and then slowly sink into a relaxed state. He felt an excruciating pain in his chest. He lay motionless, the charred remnant of his shirt stuck to his exposed skin. Searing pain shot through his legs whenever he moved. The hiking boot on his left leg had been completely blown off. Rice gradually regained consciousness as if the jolt had recharged his brain. He screamed in agony from the weight of Weiner's body on his leg. Rice's other leg was bent grotesquely under a rock. Weiner rolled off him. Next to them was Brian Jordan, his face bluish, his body slumped over. Weiner began to yell for help. The clouds began to pass over and only faint rumblings of thunder persisted from afar. In this part of Yosemite, the storm was over. Esteban, believing the danger had subsided, left the crevice and began crawling back up to the slope toward the cave. Esteban saw someone coming over the ridge at the top of the cables. He waved his arms to attract the hiker's attention. This hiker was Mike Hoog, who was a trained EMT. As Hoog entered the cave, he saw the disaster that engulfed the hiking party. The odor of burned hair and flesh hung in the air. He scurried over the worst off who was Brian Jordan. He had no pulse and was dead. He then attended to Rice and Weiner. Esteban, who now had full use of his legs, approached the cave to assist. When Rice saw him, he yelled, Adrian, 
Get your ass in here and get me out. Don't leave me behind to die like you did. Hug and Esteban carried the two out of the cave onto the open granite and laid them on the ground, both moaning and squirming in pain. Others from the group Hug was hiking with made it up to the summit and assisted the injured hiker, which included Linda Cozier, an EMT trainer. Confident Linda and the others could handle injured Rice and Weiner, Hogg figured that him being a long-distance runner should be the person to run for help. With the storm passed, Pippi and Bruce Jordan were ready to make their ascent and were back at the cables. Carl Buckner and Steve Elner finally arrived at the cables as well. They regrouped and repacked their backpacks and were beginning to start their ascent when they encountered a frenzied hug dashing down. Hikers had been hit by lightning up on top. I'm going for help, he blurted out. That's it, I'm not going any farther, I'm out of here, Elner said. He headed back down. Pippi initially thought the hiker meant the strike had occurred some time ago and refused to believe the incident involved anyone in his group. I simply blocked that notion out of my mind, he later stated. On the cables, they encountered another hurried hiker coming down. Two guys got killed and one was a young kid. Those words stunned Buckner, Pippi, and Bruce Jordan, thinking it could have been Bruce's brother who was killed. In silence, the three continued their climb, the full weight of the unfolding tragedy now hanging over them. As Pippi, Buckner, and Jordan arrived at the summit, they saw Rice. Rice shouted, the kid's dead, Frith fell over the edge. When Buckner heard this, he couldn't handle it, so he retreated down the cables to the base camp to meet Elner. They didn't sleep much as each attempted to digest the horrifying news about their comrades. As Pippi and Bruce Jordan reached others, Pippi was in disbelief. Bruce just stared blankly as if the reality of his deceased brother hadn't hit him yet. It was 8.45 p.m. and darkness was settling over Yosemite Valley. All the activity of caring for the injured hikers was happening just feet from the precipice of the sheer rock face of Half Dome. Linda Cozier was leading the triage on top of the summit, trying desperately to attend to Weiner and Rice's injuries as best as she could. Pippi was inconsolable as he felt guilty for the death of Brian, who was in his care. Around 9.30 p.m., Mike Hoog reached a ranger station and informed them of the situation unfolding on top of Half Dome. The rangers packed up their supplies and headed up to Half Dome on foot. While a helicopter was considered, it was dark and very dangerous for flying at low altitudes. Without sufficient moonlight, it wouldn't be possible. But around 11 p.m., the moonlight broke through, spurring the rangers to dispatch a helicopter from Modesto. As the rangers who were on foot reached the summit of Half Dome, they were briefed about the situation by Linda. The group was informed about the coming helicopter and set out to find a suitable landing zone on the summit. Just around midnight, the unmistakable sound of helicopter rotor blades grew louder and louder. The rangers gathered flashlights and used them as an LZ marker, positioning them in a circle. Time was crucial for the rescue as if the moonlight vanished. The helicopter might be stuck on the summit overnight. As the helicopter reached the summit, it could only take one patient at a time. It was decided that Weiner was the worse off and needed immediate attention and was the first to be evacuated down to the valley. Around 1.15 a.m., the helicopter returned for Rice and he also was flown down. And the last person to be evacuated was Esteban, who didn't need a stretcher like the other two. It was determined Rice and Weiner's injuries required specialized care at a major trauma center and were flown to UC Davis Medical Center. Back on the summit of Half Dome, the remaining hikers were spent mentally, physically, and psychologically. There was a strong sense of cohesiveness and mutual affection amongst the group, including the other hikers that stepped in to assist. Remaining on the summit from the Esteban Rice party were Bill Pippi and Bruce Jordan, who was battling with despair as the body of Brian lay in the cave just feet away. Linda Cozier, Mike Hoog, and their party remained on the summit as well. Around 6.30 a.m., a Yosemite National Park helicopter lifted off to retrieve the bodies of Bob Rith and Brian Jordan. They flew to the base of Half Dome and located Frith among the rocks, then flew to the summit to retrieve the body of Brian Jordan. Bruce got in the helicopter with the body of his brother. Shortly after, Pippi hiked down to where Carl Buckner and Steve Elner were camping 
and the three trudged back down to the valley. When Pippi arrived at the ranger station, Bruce and Brian's parents were there, which made Pippi again inconsolable as he broke down crying. Mr. Jordan's attempts to comfort Bill Pippi helped him considerably. Unaware of the events that led to the tragedy, the Jordans held Yosemite officials responsible for the disaster at Half Dome and wondered how they allowed hikers to scale Half Dome despite the hazardous weather. Linda Crozier and another member of her party, Brian Cage, gave their statements to the Rangers on what occurred. Cage stated, that's when it really hit me. As much as this was an accident caused by a combination of mother nature and poor human judgment, there remained a looming wrongful death lawsuit against Yosemite. I remember the Ranger commenting that a big money lawsuit could easily consume the entire budget, the park allots for making Half Dome, and other backcountry destinations accessible. Cage told the ranger they were prepared to testify that the accident happened because the five men in the cave had been reckless. Esteban himself had stated as much, so the Jordans were advised to not pursue a lawsuit as it would likely be dismissed. Esteban struggled with the fact his and Rice's action caused the death of two people and one is seriously injured. He also struggled with the accusation by Rice that he abandoned him. The dilemma I faced, do all I could to save someone else and let myself possibly die, or save myself and let someone else possibly die, he said. Fleeing the cave for safety of the five hikers, he endured the catastrophe with no major injuries. While thankful, the guilt nevertheless overwhelmed him. He sank into a deep depression and nightmares of Frith toppling off the edge. Tom Rice and Bruce Weiner were hospitalized at UC Davis Medical Center, where both were in critical condition. Bruce spent three weeks or so at UC Davis and then was shipped home to Boston, where he stayed in the hospital in a burn unit. He had suffered major kidney damage and required a lot of skin grafts. Unfortunately for him, his grafts got infected and needed to be ripped off and replaced, a process Bruce says was worse than actually getting hit. Bruce lost over 70 pounds while he was bedridden. Unfortunately, most of that weight was muscle, which he had to gain all the way back so he could do fun things like walk correctly again. To this day, Bruce still has muscle loss from the experience. There is permanent nerve damage that he'll likely deal with for the rest of his life. He also has some lingering kidney problems. To this day, the lightning strike won't even let him pee normally. When Weiner reflects on what happened more than 30 years later, he is grateful. The people that took care of us rescued us and got us out of the cave and looked after us for all those hours until the helicopter came. They didn't know us. They just took it upon themselves to be there and never asked for anything. I'm always going to be very grateful. He also said it was reckless and irresponsible for the experienced leaders of the group, Rice and Esteban, to tell outdoor rookies like him and Frith that there was a safe haven on the summit in the event of a lightning storm. In reality, it was the least safe place we could have chosen to be at that moment, short of standing on top of that mountain with a big lightning rod in our hands, which is essentially what we were doing. But he also takes responsibility for his own ignorance and the dangerous situation it led him to, along with the self-imposed pressure and peer pressure to reach the summit. It was my responsibility to look out for myself and be smart. Ultimately, we made the decision and no one held a gun to our heads. Tom Rice was in the intensive care unit for weeks and had severe burns on his legs. He resented the fact that Esteban hadn't suffered any injuries and lambasted him for leaving. Esteban stormed out. Linda Crozier, the hiker who stepped in as the lead nurse on the summit, visited Rice many times during his hospital stay in Davis. He made a full recovery months later. The very next summer, Esteban, Rice, and Pippi returned to Half Dome Summit. We had to prove to ourselves we can do this, Rice stated. Adrian Esteban returned many times to Half Dome as it continued to serve as a barometer of his physical and mental well-being. The rock chamber, however, became a sacred place to not be disturbed and stayed away from the enclosure during his ascents. On Wednesday, July 21st, 2010, the handful of parties hoping to summit the Grand Teton would all experience a mountain climber's worst nightmare. All awoke early and were camped above the timberline. 
Some were in a seasonal hut, others in tents. A few climbers, taking advantage of the clear night, had unrolled their sleeping bags between boulders and slept out under the stars. The day before, the forecast had been typical for the Tetons in summer, partly cloudy with a chance of thunderstorms by afternoon. But overnight, the likelihood of a storm had increased, so the commercial guides hustled their clients out of their sleeping bags at 3.30 a.m. At close to 4.30, three self-guided groups began pulling on their harnesses, helmets, and headlamps, and a half hour later they were making their way with coils of rope up through the talus and bands of cracked rock to the near vertical terrain below the summit. They were aware of clouds on the horizon but determined to get to the top and back down before they closed in. They had less time than they imagined. Leading the first of the three groups were two brothers from Newton, Iowa, Greg and Barry Sparks, and their old friend from Bob Miller, all in their 50s. Their group was relatively large, eight in all, and had the widest range of age and climbing experience. The eight were relatives and church friends, such as Greg's son-in-law, Tim Vogelar, 43, a middle school art teacher. Over the years, some of them had been up Devil's Tower, Gannett Peak, and scores of Colorado's 14ers, mountains over 14,000 feet high. The Sparks Group planned to climb via the Owen Spalding Route, the oldest and easiest way up the Grand. This year, Barry Sparks had invited his daughter, Katie's boyfriend, Brandon Olden Camp. He and Katie weren't engaged, but it seemed to be moving in that direction, Barry said. I hoped this trip would be a chance for him and I to get to know each other better. His prospective son-in-law jumped at the offer. The Sparks Group had the whole week to work with and began with climbs of the South and Middle Tetons. Everyone made it to the top of the South Teton with no problem, but the old guys decided to conserve their energy and leave the middle to the younger four, who summited in brilliant sunshine on Tuesday. The second group, the Tyler Party, was a father and son's trip. There was dad, Stephen Tyler, his two sons, Dan and Mike, their brother-in-law, Troy Smith, and a work friend of Stephen's, Henry Appleton. Stephen, 67, had always been an outdoorsman, taking Dan and Mike backpacking from an early age. Stephen had first topped out on the Grand Teton in 1966. In 1983, when Dan and Mike were 13 and 12 respectively, they'd all tried it together. Bad weather kept them from the top at that time. Still, it wasn't as if the Tylers felt they had unfinished business. They just wanted to take advantage of the fact that they'd finally found a week in which they could all climb together. Stephen Tyler and Appleton, 31, were already there both working in Grand Teton National Park. The Tyler party also chose the Owen Spalding route. The third group, a couple and two friends from Bozeman, was led by Alan Klein, a 27-year-old climbing guide originally from Virginia. He had planned to go to Wyoming with only his friend Andrew Larson, 23, but at the last minute, Klein's girlfriend Betsy Smith, 26, and their friend Matt Walker, 21, rearranged their schedules and joined them. Klein and Smith had met in Yellowstone three years earlier and fallen in love over their shared love of the wilderness. The Bozeman group had climbed together too, but not in the Tetons. For their ascent, Klein settled on the Exum Ridge route. The Exum gets a little more sun than the Owen Spalding, but it's on a ridge, so there's nowhere to hide, and it's trickier to descend than other popular routes. After setting out that Wednesday morning, all three parties made good progress. By about nine or so, the Bozeman group had made it to within a hundred vertical feet of the summit. The Tyler party had made it up through the Owen chimney, considered the hardest challenge of the route, and the Sparks group, moving a little more slowly because of its size, had just cleared the belly roll, a detached car-sized flake of rock bisecting a narrow ledge that requires one to climb up and over it, or out and around it. The handholds are solid, but climbers are exposed to a sheer drop of 800 to 1,000 feet. For someone new to climbing, it's terrifying to anticipate and enormously rewarding to overcome. When Oldenkamp made it past the belly roll, he flashed a wide, goofy smile that made him look as if he had just won a junior high league championship with a shot at the buzzer. Though the climbing was going well, the skies were darkening, and over the next half hour just about everyone wondered if it was time to turn back, except for Klein, who determined that it would actually be faster and safer for his crew to summit and quickly descend by the Owen Spalding route, then to backtrack. By 11.30 a.m., the Tyler party had turned around. Mike set up a rappel, an anchored rope to descend on, through the Owen chimney. He reached the bottom easily, 
and Dan had just started down the 80-foot chute when the first pulse of electricity coursed down over the wet rock. The Sparks group, 150 to 200 feet below the Tyler party, also felt it. I really don't know what you'd call it. It wasn't lightning like you've never seen lightning, Vogelar said. It zinged down our rope. I felt it leave from my elbow, but I didn't see a flash. There was no boom that first time either. Other climbers near Vogelar saw blue sparks and arcs around their shoes, and the jolt lifted Cameron Johnson, another member of the Sparks group from Worthington Mini, off the rock a few inches before setting him down, unscorched. For an instant, most of the Tyler Party climbers were more amazed than panicked. But that's when we all agreed we should go down now, Vogelar said. The Tyler Party was mostly unaffected by that first bolt, except for Appleton. His right leg was numb. Dan Tyler, hearing Appleton cry out, I can't feel my leg, I can't feel my leg, stopped rappelling down and started back up the rope to help. He wouldn't get there. Out on the Exum Ridge, things were even direr. Thunder sounded in the clouds that had engulfed them, and Klein told his three Bozeman group partners to toss into a pile as much of their metal as possible. Carabiners, cameras, pocket knives. Unfortunately, Smith forgot to remove her metal-plated wristwatch. From the clouds, there came a low buzzing sound. Klein suggested that they step apart from each other, not that there was far for any of them to go. There were huge drops on both sides, then they stood on their climbing ropes as insulation as their pile of gear vibrated, popped, and sparked. When we got struck, it was like slow motion, Betsy Smith said. I was watching Alan and Walker fall, and I was thinking they're falling, but not realizing I was falling too. Though the lightning probably struck within 50 yards of them, electricity buckled their legs leaving Smith's and Walker's completely numb. They lay on the rock where they had been standing. The charge also entered Smith's and Klein's bodies. It was the most painful thing, Smith said. I've been through childbirth and that was zero compared to this. It was like someone injected hot oil directly into my veins. I was screaming. When she came to a moment later, she could see the cuff on the sleeve of her parka smoking and smell burned hair and flesh, her own. And then, for the moment, it was almost peaceful. Clouds rushing past, wind and rain hissing on the dense rock. The climbers were still in pain, but it was subsiding, and they looked at one another with anxious relief. Hey, maybe that was it? Then the low buzzing began to build again. Some fierce storms on the Grand Teton barely registered down in the valley, but not this one. This was not the afternoon shower that frequently arrives at altitude in the Rockies and blows out an hour later, leaving blue skies in its wake. This storm was monsoonal, and it featured cells that built along a pressure front like a line of freight cars. Worst of all, these cells regenerated themselves. Dan Tyler had made it only a few feet back up the rope when lightning struck again, so close that he was showered with small rocks kicked loose by the blast, followed immediately by a deafening boom. Dan, though, wasn't conscious to hear it. It knocked me into oblivion, he said of the lightning. When I came to, I was hanging upside down. And for a few seconds, I wasn't sure where I was. I was completely disoriented. I then realized I was hanging on the rope. The next thing I noticed was that my legs were heavy. I couldn't feel them. His right arm was dead too. I was unsure what to do and somewhat panicked, but I eventually realized I needed to get myself off that rope. So I fed some slack into the belaying device and was able to turn myself so my legs were below me. As Dan tried to navigate the narrow passage with a single arm, his legs were snagged against the wall and bent back unnaturally. It occurred to him that if he pressed too hard, he might break his own legs and not feel it. Maybe five minutes later, another lightning strike knocked some rocks loose above him. The rocks were small, but as they scattered down the chute, they added to a growing sense that the climbers were under siege. Above Mike and Dan, out of their sight, the charge had leveled Troy Smith too. He fell, gashed his head, and stopped breathing. Steven Tyler had collapsed right next to him, and he saw Smith's eyes roll back, but he couldn't lift his own arms or move his legs. With an effort, he rolled Smith, who had fallen across his arm, and gave him mouth to mouth. After a half dozen exhalations, Smith inhaled on his own, but he still wasn't all there. The ensuing three hours still do not exist in his memory. Mike couldn't see Dan, much less his dad, his brother-in-law, and Appleton and he yelled to them over the noise of the storm, asking if they were okay. Dan and the party above yelled to each other, but neither could hear what the other said. Dan and Mike had better luck communicating and agreed that Mike should go for help. 
The only problem with that was that it left Dan alone and without any information about what had happened to his dad or the others. Like Mike and Dan Tyler, Greg Sparks had used the time since the first strike to lower himself and Brandon Oldenkamp down to a ledge, the very one that runs into the belly roll. Their group had decided that since Brandon was new to climbing, Greg should go down first and be there to see that Oldenkamp gained the ledge safely. Both did. Then the second bolt hit. Unlike the first one, it not only buckled their legs, but also packed a concussive punch. From three feet away, Greg watched helplessly as the force of the jolt propelled Oldenkamp off the ledge and over the side. To Greg's greater horror, the young man's rope did not catch and go taut. Instead, Greg could see the end of the rope on the wet stone. The rope Greg swore was slipped through Oldenkamp's harness loop and knotted at the end to prevent him from falling more than a few feet. Desperate, Greg craned over the cliff, but he knew it was hopeless. Below him, 800 feet down, lay the Black Ice Couloir, a glaciated 50-degree ramp that drained over a series of cliffs into Valhalla Canyon. No surviving that. It just took him off, Greg said months later, still with a trace of disbelief. He swore Oldenkamp was tied into the rope, which would make the fall impossible, unless, that is, his harness failed, or the carabiner through which the rope passed had popped open, releasing the rope. Even then, the knot could have saved him. He couldn't have unclipped, Greg said, I'd have seen him. I was right there. He couldn't understand how it happened. He still can't. With the hand that worked best, Steven Tyler fished in his pack for his cell phone. He couldn't close his grip, and he had split his lip, so things got a little clumsy and bloody. Under different circumstances, he thought, it might have been slapstick. Eventually, he toggled to the most recent calls list and clicked on the last one he'd placed, which, he seemed to remember, had been to a ranger station for a weather update. He'd forgotten that Dan had since used the phone to check in with his wife, Heidi. So Stephen's daughter-in-law, at a lodge with several of his grandchildren, picked up. He had one bar of wireless connectivity. No way could he risk dropping the call. As evenly as he could, he told her their situation. He did not volunteer details about Dan. He wouldn't have known what to say. Heidi's call was relayed to the Jenny Lake Rangers at 12.24 p.m. The Jenny Lake Rangers, or simply the Climbing Rangers, have evolved into one of the elite rescue teams in the world. In 1967, this elite force became renowned for a legendary rescue on the north face of the Grand Teton. Seven rangers risked their lives to save a severely injured climber and his companion. The recovery took three harrowing days and pushed the team to new abilities. The legacy of this rescue was passed down throughout the years. A haven for dirtball climbers looking to get paid to hang out in the Tetons, the group has plenty of loners and mountain men, but it also has people who've done law enforcement training, a mix of type A's and poets that works. As physically fit as professional athletes, they exhibit the bonhomie of a championship ball club, rarely missing a chance to rib one another. In all, there are four full-timers and 14 seasonal rangers. Among them, the climbing rangers have amassed 230 years of experience in the Tetons. Soon after Stevens' SOS, more calls came in, and the rangers didn't know if they were members of the same party or from different parties. In the office of the rescue cache, their headquarters at the base of Tiwanot Mountain, northeast of the Grand Teton, the climbing rangers tried to make sense of what they were hearing as there were many people on the mountain needing rescue. Ranger Jack McConnell remembers with head-shaking astonishment, that's a bus wreck on a mountain. By the time the rangers had a better grip on how many people they were looking for, a few of them, including McConnell and Helen Bowers, were already airborne in a chopper flown by a 30-year-old ace named Matt Hart. Though he'd been the head of the climbing rangers only one month, 34-year-old Scott Gunther had made the bold decision to launch a search and rescue operation, even though rain had begun to fall in the valley. Thunder rumbled not from far, the cache and the Grand Teton itself had vanished under a low ceiling of dark clouds. Hart flew a yellow A-star B3 with the doors off. That high on the Grand, there was no place for a helicopter to land, so the rangers would have to pull people off using a procedure called the short haul. First introduced in the Tetons in 1986, short hauling involves attaching a cable to a helicopter with either a litter or a so-called screamer suit, which isn't a suit really, 
but a full body harness that works well for anyone who hasn't suffered spinal injuries. The injured party has his or her arms and legs put through sewn holes and is then clipped into the cable and whisked away. It's like a jacket diaper configuration, McConnell explains, but it's the best ride in the Tetons, a tilt-a-whirl on steroids. A number of the climbing rangers had done short hauls before. Once in 2005, the rangers had short hauled 13 climbers, also lightning struck from just below the Exum Ridge. The 2005 rescue had been another long day, but that storm had swiftly blown out. The rangers simply raced against nightfall when it's no longer safe to fly the chopper. This time was different. Hart and the rangers were going into the teeth of the storm. Hart's first destination was the lower saddle, one of the two main base camps for those climbing the Grand. Exum Mountain Guides, one of two commercial services with permits to guide the Grand, maintains a hut there from June to September. The service volunteered the hut as a base camp for the operation. As soon as they touched down on the lower saddle, McConnell and Bowers recruited Exum guide Dan Korn to go up the mountain with them. A sunny, highly accomplished alpinist who climbs and guides year-round, Korn, 27, had been among those who'd left for the summit at 3.30 a.m. and with two fit clients, been to the top and returned to the lower saddle base camp before the lightning strikes. McConnell was glad to have Korn on the search party so he could give the younger man the heaviest gear and medical kits. Within a half hour, before reaching the steepest rock faces, McConnell, Bowers, and Korn encountered Mike Tyler and a couple of members of the Sparks party on their way down. Mike had lost his gloves, so Korn gave him his. Bowers stayed with the climbers. McConnell and Korn continued on up. Luckily, they came within view of three other members of the Sparks group, including Vogelar, just in time. The shell-shocked trio was about to make a common but life-threatening mistake and head toward the so-called Idaho Express, a cliff that dropped several thousand feet off the Grand's west face. Don't go down that way, it's a death trap, Korn yelled into the wind. Hearing them, Vogelar and the others stopped and made their way to the Black Rock chimneys, the right way down. The storm had let up a bit, and Hart made a quick pass around the base of the summit pyramid. He soon had a bead on all the stricken climbers, but it would still be an hour or more before the rangers could reach them and begin the short hauls. In the meantime, a second helicopter brought more rangers to the lower saddle. They too started up. McConnell and Korn met up with the last of the Sparks group and helped them down to the hut on their own steam and then returned to climbing in earnest. It was difficult with water gushing down the rock and pouring from chutes in flash waterfalls. The faces they saw as they poked up out of the Owen chimney still haunt Corn. All the climbers could answer him on topic, but they were not all there. They looked like zombies. Steven Tyler and Troy Smith were especially ghoulish, bluish with cold. Blood streaked down their faces. A slush of snow and small hailstones lined the seams of their parkas. Steven told Corn he thought he'd gone hypothermic. They had a winter layer on, but they'd been in the storm for more than three hours without being able to move. In the mountains especially, motion is heat, and heat is life. Larson from the Klein group had been trying to find help and had reached rangers who had gathered the lightning victims and huddled with them under a slight overhang to await the helicopter. The storm had picked up force again, and they all ditched their metal. McConnell had begun to pull a tarp over one side of the overhang for a bit of extra shelter when electricity snapped at his elbow. More lightning. The morale of the group which had greatly improved when the helicopter passed over and the rangers arrived, sank. The rangers were running out of time if they were to get everyone off by dark, and the urgency grew now with the intensifying storm. Hart banked the helicopter in toward the rock and dropped the cable. The screamer suit slid down the cable. McConnell detached it and tried to throw it to another ranger, but it fell short. They scrambled for a minute while Hart tried to hold his position in the A-star the wind and rain whipping in his face as he flew. His co-pilot kept an eye on the tail rotor to make sure it didn't swing into the rock. That would be deadly. A stripped-down version of the A-Star had made it all the way to the summit of Everest on a 2005 stunt flight, so the aircraft had no problem with the thin air. But holding a chopper steady in those conditions takes a rare, zen-like skill. Finally, the Rangers got the harness set between Troy Smith's legs and under his arms 
and hooked him to the cable with two big carabiners. The rangers took a step back and waved to Hart, and the chopper whisked Smith right off the rock and out into the void. Still not comprehending that he'd been struck by lightning, Smith found the ride, as McConnell promised, awesome. He didn't scream, he gave a hoarse whoop of joy. Over the next two hours, all of the climbers but Dan Tyler were evacuated at least as far down as the lower saddle, where the second helicopter had begun ferrying injured climbers to the valley. For the climbing rangers in the cache, the operation had become a logistical drama as they coordinated 70 plus people in what had become the most complex rescue in the park's 82 year history, and it wasn't over. The ranger weatherman advised pulling the chopper out to see what the next storm cell had in store before attempting another short haul. It was like an F-16 ripping open the sky, McConnell said of that squall. It was decided that he'd head down while rangers Drew Hardesty and Marty Vidak stayed with Dan. Some feeling had returned to Dan's arms and legs and he could wiggle his toes a little, but he was terribly cold. McConnell told them he really hated to be going so soon. Dan appreciated the humor, but he really wanted off that mountain. He couldn't face the prospect of being out overnight and it was starting to get dim. For Dan, the helicopter hadn't just represented hope, it was hope and now it was leaving. His despair didn't last long. Within the hour, Hart had taken advantage of another short window in the storm to return and pluck Dan off. Dan did not enjoy the short haul ride nearly as much as his brother-in-law had. Out in the vast space over all that rock and snow of the Tetons, he had trouble breathing. He shivered and closed his eyes until it was over. It was just too much. Dan only spent 15 minutes in the base camp hut, just long enough to be stuffed into a sleeping bag and given a cup of hot chocolate flown down to the valley. He still couldn't walk, but he was feeling like he would eventually. Once in the valley, the EMTs ran an IV into him and had him wait in an ambulance. It's a 30 minute drive to the hospital, so the rangers had to take more than one at a time. A few minutes passed, they opened up the back of the ambulance and his dad entered. The old man was roughed up, split lip, dried blood on his nose, some loss of hearing, but he'd made it. Dan broke down. He had never been happier to see his dad in his life. The following morning, Hart started up the A-Star again for the grim trip out to Valhalla Canyon to recover Brandon Oldenkamp's body. Like all the climbing rangers, Hart knew well that adventures in the mountains could carry fateful consequences. The park averages one to three deaths per year, statistically not bad perhaps given the four million visitors. But Hart found Oldenkamp's death profoundly sad. At least he and the other rangers had been able to save the lives of a handful more. Hypothermia and other injuries could have proved fatal to several of the lightning victims had there not been a helicopter to get them down fast. Several of the climbers were back at their lodge rooms by 9 or 10 that night, but a few had more serious medical issues. Troy Smith turned out to be okay, but would be loopy for weeks. Betsy Smith lost the index finger on her right hand, where the charge had exited her body, killing all the tissue. The finger had to be amputated and stitched up. Her wristwatch had burned her left arm severely. The arm was so swollen that surgeons had to cut it to keep blood flowing into her left hand. Only Alan Klein ended up in the ICU. He had burns across his back and probably should have died. The electricity that had coursed through him had torn his lungs slightly, allowing air to seep into his chest and put pressure on his heart, which was beating at only 35 beats per minute when he was admitted to the hospital. The doctor who saw me told me I had more air in my chest than anyone he'd ever seen who wasn't dead, Klein says. One year later, Steven Tyler still can't hear as well though he's not sure if that's all from the lightning or from turning 68. Most of the rest have made a full recovery, at least physically. Several have continued climbing. For Klein, it's his livelihood. Others have forsworn it, or plan to do less ambitious hikes, all under blue skies, thank you very much. Asked if he'd attempt the grand again, Mike Tyler says, no, I think we got the message. The ranger who coordinated the rescue from headquarters, Jim Springer, investigated why Oldenkamp's rope and harness hadn't broken his fall. It appeared Oldenkamp might have passed the rope through a weaker loop on his harness, one not designed to take his weight. Or maybe the rope slipped out of the carabiner on his harness, which had been found unlocked. Or maybe, reaching the ledge, Oldenkamp had simply unclipped from the rope. Oldenkamp was devoted to God, and his family says his faith, and theirs, has helped them earn a measure of peace. I still weep sometimes, his father, Bob Oldenkamp, says. We weren't ready for him to go. 
But I do know that in those mountains, Brandon saw the best the Creator has ever made. And in a heartbeat, he got to see him who made it. For Alex Lofgren and Emily Henkel, the extremes of the park will show to be hard to overcome. Lofgren and Henkel, both experienced campers, set off for Death Valley with jugs of water, camping gear, and at least one day's worth of food. On April 3, 2021, the couple left Helendale, California for a routine camping trip in Death Valley. The next day began the biggest nightmare of their lives. Alex was known for camping in remote areas and Emily grew to love the excursions with her boyfriend. The couple left in the morning with the goal to experience the popular destinations the park has to offer and camping later that night. Alex and Emily's camping excursions usually consist of an approximate area they would like to camp, not a specific campground. Earlier, a park ranger suggested an area that required traveling on a backcountry road which ended up being Gold Valley Road, an unpaved four-wheel drive road that cuts a solitary path through the backcountry of the park. They were driving a Subaru Forester, an automobile built for rugged terrain, so there was little concern that the vehicle couldn't handle the road. Around 5.30 p.m. on April 3, 2021, as they were driving, they heard two loud pops. Emily's heart dropped. They got out of the Subaru and found that the two passenger side tires were punctured by a rock in the road. With only one spare tire, Alex and Emily were stranded in a very remote section of Death Valley and 22 miles from a main road with no cell phone service. No shade or water in sight, there was nothing of benefit for them to survive. Survival mode kicked in for the couple. They spent the remainder of the evening plotting their escape. Alex and Emily always came prepared for the most part, so they used maps and books to devise a plan for tomorrow. They packed a day pack, liters of water and a couple of bags of tuna each, a survival kit, and anything else of use to prepare for tomorrow's trek. They fell asleep in the Subaru, knowing they needed all the rest to could get for the important day. Alex and Emily woke up at 4 a.m. the next day. The couple decided against hiking the 22 miles they'd just traveled. Instead, they chose to trek toward Mormon Point. The route they chose was through a mountain pass on a designated trail with the hope that help would be close by. The path required crossing through a canyon with steep drops. They left a note in the car stating, two flat tires headed to Mormon Point have three days worth of water. They fortified the Subaru with many indications they were stranded and laid rocks on the ground in the shape of an arrow, pointing to the direction they were traveling. In the darkness of the desert, they proceed on their mission. The moon was extremely bright that early morning. They knew they were on a life and death mission but at this moment, it felt like any other hike and were still able to enjoy the scenery Death Valley has to offer. As they reached the trail, Alex gathered some rocks and made another arrow pointing to the direction of their trek. Around 8 a.m., they spotted a geocache, a container containing a log book and trade items that can be found on hiking trails. This gave the couple some semblance of hope knowing the trail is well-traveled. They continue down the trail where the difficulty of the trail increases into a slot canyon. Huge rock walls towered over them. The terrain was rocky. In the geocache logbook, someone mentioned a 70-foot waterfall close by. A mile down the path, they reached the waterfall but had a dire realization. There was no easy way down. As they look over the ledge, it was a solid drop down. This was an established climbing route that required rope and harnesses, something obviously they did not have. They looked around to see if there was any other way down. Unfortunately, there wasn't. It was here they made the decision to forge on. Alex looked to see if there were any boulders that made natural steps down the cliff. Alex proceeded to climb down with Emily nervously looking on saying, no unnecessary risks. One step at a time, take it easy, be careful. Alex works his way down the cliff, but he comes to a standstill. Alex yells, can't find a way down, I'm going to work myself back up. As he climbs up, Alex yells, I lost my grip. What do you mean you lost your grip? Emily yells. Emily knew this was not going to end well. She looked for anything around to help him up. Moments later, he fully loses his grip. He falls 70 feet down the waterfall as Emily looks on horrified. She was beside herself. She didn't know what to do. By some miracle, he was still alive. He yelled to Emily to get help. She made a quick and possibly deathly decision. 
A few minutes prior to the fall, she had seen a potential way down. Alex fell down the right side of the canyon. On the left side, there was a body crack in the rock. It was very steep, but she knew that was her only way down. She knew her life was at risk, but she had to be down there with Alex. Emily manages to get to the left side of the canyon, her arms gripping both sides of the crack. She makes her way down. About halfway down, there was nowhere else for her to grab on to climb down with approximately 30 feet left to reach the ground. She drops her backpack in hopes it would break her fall. Emily lets go. She lands on her feet. She snaps her ankle in half. She gets up to do a checkup on herself. To her amazement, the ankle was the only injury she suffered. With adrenaline numbing the pain, her only concern was Alex. Emily makes her way to him. Alex succumbed to his injuries. Alex passed away on Easter Sunday, April 4, 2021. But Emily was in a dire situation. With her boyfriend deceased, Emily somehow had to gather herself and access the situation. To her despair, she realizes they have fallen onto a cliff midway down. There was another 100-foot drop off the ledge of the cliff. Even without a broken ankle, there was no way out. The day was filled with feelings of despair, guilt, horror, and what-ifs. But she knew these feelings were not going to lift her out of this dire situation. When she woke up the next day, to her dismay, what had happened wasn't a nightmare. This was still real. Her boyfriend was dead, and she was trapped alone on a ledge in a slot canyon with no way out. She gathered herself and took stock of what she had to survive. She had water and food they packed the night before. Fortunately, they also packed a survival kit which consisted of a Mylar emergency blanket. She managed to build some shelter in the form of stacking rocks that covered her face and upper body. Emily had packed a solar charger, which allowed her to keep her phone charged for the entirety of the ordeal. This allowed her to jot down the thoughts she had. She knew she was at the mercy of the search and rescue teams. But she had hope and wrote every day that they will get out. They will be rescued. But there was part of her that knew the chance of rescue was slim. This was such a remote and desolate place. It was hard to fathom that someone would find them. Although she was in a shaded canyon, she was trapped in one of the hottest places on Earth with Alex's body nearby. Every day around 1.30 p.m., the sun peeked through the canyon and was more vulnerable to sunburn and dehydration. Fortunately, she found a little nook on the ledge that provided some shelter from the direct sunlight for the next four hours until the sun moved past the canyon chasm. An hour before the unbearable sun peeked its ugly head, there was a checklist of things she needed to do to make it through the day. The most important item on the to-do list was to make it through the hottest part of the day. The waterfall was more like a running stream and was a vital lifeline. She directed the stream and made a small dam where she could soak her towel and clothes in an attempt to keep her body temperature down. The Mylar blanket was not only useful for keeping her warm at night but was shade from the sun as well. The blanket was fragile and kept ripping, so she used band-aids from the survival kit to keep it together. She spent nearly an hour every day repairing the blanket. She had to keep the blanket intact. Next to food and water, it would be her most valuable item and it would provide more value as the days go on. Back in civilization, news of the missing couple reached nationwide, and search and rescue teams scoured Death Valley National Park for days. On Wednesday, April 7, 2021, the entire Death Valley Highway was searched, and every monument and attraction along the route was checked. Alex had entered a backcountry registration log, listing their destinations while they were in the park, and each was checked to no avail. By the time authorities found their car in a remote stretch of the park on Gold Valley Road, the couple had been missing for four days. Inside the abandoned white Subaru, the note stating their destination was found. The April 8th discovery marked a turning point in the desperate search for Alex and Emily. They knew where to look for them. It was on this day early in the morning that Emily heard the helicopter propellers in a distance. Emily's mind races. She knew this was it. She sees the helicopter pass over her. It didn't see her. Then she heard the propellers again and it was louder. She waves the Mylar blanket. The helicopter spots it. At last, Emily and the body of Alex were found. The helicopter leaves to Emily's bewilderment. But she knew she was spotted. One hour passed, and another hour, and another. At this point, her old nemesis, the Death Valley Sun, is looming. So with great disappointment, she returns to the routine she had become accustomed to the past few days. 
Soak the towel, soak the clothes, sit in the nook on the ledge to hide from the sun. Around 7.30 p.m., Emily is awakened by a similar sound, but on a smaller scale. A bright light beams down at her. A drone was sent to communicate with Emily. She was annoyed at this point and had to endure for another night. The next day, she was hopeful to finally be rescued. She heard the propellers again, this time from Navy Search and Rescue. Rescuers initially attempted a hoist operation to reach the couple, but two team members who rappelled down were not able to reach them due to the extreme location. The canyon was narrow and the wind from the propellers made it a complicated rescue. Finally, after 20 minutes of attempting to rappel, they reached Emily. They strap her into the rescue stretcher and lift her out of the canyon. Emily closes her eyes as she's being lifted up. She couldn't bear to watch. After a little while, she takes a peek and looks around. All she could see is the vast nothingness of beige rocks under her. She couldn't believe how they found her. Emily was transported to a hospital for emergency surgery. She stayed for six days. Fortunately, the decision she made to keep her shoes on to prevent the swelling from her broken ankle saved her foot. Shortly after, she returned to her hometown of Cincinnati, Ohio. After serving in the United States Marine Corps and deploying to Afghanistan in 2011, he was medically discharged after four years of honorable service. Alex Lofgren received a bachelor's degree in political science from Arizona State University. He joined the district office of Reverend Raul M. Grijalva in 2019 as part of the Wounded Warrior Fellowship Program. He was a caseworker on a crisis line helping veterans in immediate need at the time. Alex and Emily met when she traveled to Arizona for a one-year volunteer commitment through the AmeriCorps VISTA program. She was placed with a nonprofit organization that worked to provide education and resources to employers across the state of Arizona to serve veterans. Alex was incredibly passionate about everything he did, especially when it came to helping veterans on a local, state, and eventually federal level. I always thought he was precisely the missing piece they needed to get things done among the decision makers with his stubborn and strong-willed attitude, ready to tackle any challenge presented before him. He had a flight scheduled to Washington, D.C., two weeks after our Death Valley trip for that exact reason, to meet those that would mentor him, the world his oyster. Not being able to see what accomplishments he would have made will forever remain on my extensive list of what-ifs, Emily stated. Alex's livelihood was making sure every veteran lived the life they deserved by whatever means he could provide. He also understood the healing powers of nature and made efforts to have veterans experience the outdoors. Emily felt a calling to make sure his efforts never end, and now is the president of a nonprofit organization, Veterans in Parks. Not long after the ordeal, Emily learned of his former employer, Congressman Raul Grijalva, that the Alexander Lofgren Veterans in Parks Act was in the works. If signed into law, this act would allow all service members, veterans, and Gold Star families access to national parks and lands for free, for life. On December 27, 2021, it was officially signed into law only eight months after his tragic passing. His legacy lives on. For all its beauty and splendor, the wilderness can be a cruel teacher. Running an ultramarathon is an extraordinary journey that invites us to explore the profound depths of human endurance, resilience, and the sheer joy of pushing our limits. 
It's a true test of not just physical strength, but also mental fortitude and unwavering determination. The unforgiving terrain, harsh weather, and the relentless toll on your body pose formidable obstacles. Please click the subscribe and like buttons. This is Outdoor Disasters. The Sahara Desert, a vast sea of golden dunes and timeless landscapes, beckons us with its breathtaking beauty and mysterious allure. In the heart of the Sahara, where shifting sands, shaped by the winds of time, remind us of the ever-changing nature of life itself. The Sahara Desert is the largest hot desert in the world, covering an expansive area of approximately 3.6 million square miles, or 9.2 million square kilometers. It stretches across North Africa, spanning over a dozen countries. The Sahara is known for its extreme climate, characterized by scorching daytime temperatures that can exceed 120 degrees in some areas, as well as bitterly cold nights. Rainfall is exceptionally scarce, and many parts of the Sahara receive less than an inch of precipitation annually. The Sahara's landscape is dominated by vast sand dunes, rocky plateaus, and gravel plains. The iconic sand dunes, such as those in the Erg Chebi dune field in Morocco, can reach heights of over 500 feet or 150 meters. Despite its arid nature, the Sahara features pockets of life in the form of oases, where water flows to the surface, creating fertile areas with vegetation. These oases have historically been crucial for trade routes and settlements. The Sahara presents numerous challenges, including water scarcity, harsh climatic conditions, and limited arable land. The Sahara Desert is a region of stark beauty, ancient history, and unique ecological adaptations. It is a testament to the power of nature's artistry, a masterpiece of sand and sky that leaves an indelible mark on the human spirit. It calls to the adventurer within us, inviting us to explore its wonders. For Mauro Persoperi, his desert excursion would test the limits of human survival. In 1994, Mauro Prosperi, an Italian police officer and former Olympic pentathlete, sought to test his physical limits. At 39 years old, married with three young children, Mauro constantly sought new challenges to push himself. His quest led him to discover the Marathon de Sable, also known as the Marathon of the Sands or the Sahara Marathon, hailed as the most grueling foot race on Earth. This annual ultramarathon spans six days, covering a staggering 156 miles, equivalent to completing six standard marathons. Set against the harsh backdrop of the Sahara Desert in southern Morocco, it's a relentless multi-stage adventure through a legendary terrain, one of the planet's harshest environments. Participants in this race must be entirely self-sufficient, carrying all their food and equipment on their backs for the entire week. Each night, communal goat's hair Berber tents are erected for shelter. But beyond that, competitors must bear the burden of their belongings. Water is strictly rationed and exceeding the allotted amount incurs a time penalty. Prosperi recalled his reaction to learning about the infamously difficult ultramarathon. I love a challenge, so I started training immediately, running 40 kilometers a day, reducing the amount of water I was drinking to get used to dehydration. I was never home. My wife, Tinzia, thought I was insane. The race is so risky that you have to sign a form to say where you want your body to be sent in case you die. Following rigorous preparation, he boarded a flight to Morocco to commence the race. The 1994 event boasted a mere 134 participants, leaving Prosperi to navigate the majority of the six-day expedition in solitude. At the race's outset, organizers delivered a briefing, urging runners to seek shelter during sandstorms and advising them to head in the direction of the clouds forming at sunset if they became lost. Yet, as Prosperi recalls, there aren't many shelters in the desert. In the middle of the dunes, it's hard to find a place that will defend you. Mauro Prosperi's journey across the Sahara Desert was progressing smoothly. The fourth day of the Marathon de Sables was the longest single stage, spanning 57 miles or 92 kilometers between campsites. On April 14, 1994, scorching temperatures reached 115 degrees as Prosperi reached the third checkpoint which was 20 miles or 48 kilometers into the day's grueling trek. Despite the oppressive heat, Prosperi remained in seventh place and maintained an impressive pace. The runners were closing in on the finish line at Zagora, 
a Berber village nestled in the palm-filled Draa Valley. Giovanni Manzo, a friend from Sicily who was running alongside him, assisted in taping up a worsening blister on Prosperi's foot. Afterward, Prosperi collected his two-liter water allocation and continued his run. Around 1 p.m., unexpected high winds whipped up a sudden sandstorm, prompting race organizers to halt the event for the day. Other participants sought refuge and eventually reached the fourth checkpoint by nightfall. However, Manzo arrived at the checkpoint, but Prosperi was nowhere to be seen. Manzo couldn't comprehend what might have happened. Prosperi had been ahead of him, and even considering the storm's delay, he should have arrived hours earlier. Nevertheless, the race officials believed that Prosperi couldn't have strayed far. According to the race regulations, in the event of a sandstorm, runners were required to stop and await further instructions. The race officials determined that a comprehensive search would commence the following morning. At first light on Friday, race staff deployed Land Rovers to comb the trail while a pilot conducted an aerial reconnaissance in an ultralight aircraft. The searchers followed a systematic grid pattern as they scoured the terrain. They recognized the urgency of the situation as Prosperi had at most only two liters of water, and by noon, temperatures would soar into the triple digits. Despite their exhaustive efforts, there was no sign of him. Mauro Prosperi had inexplicably vanished. When he began to pass through a section of the race that was dominated by small dunes, the sand around him started to lift and swirl. Small dunes, unlike large ones, walk, he says. The swirling resembled a dance, rhythmic and mesmerizing at first, but the rhythm became insistent, and before he knew what was happening, Prosperi faced a yellow wall. A huge sandstorm engulfed Mauro. I couldn't see anything. The wind blew so violently the sand hurt. Therefore, he pressed onward, attempting to find shelter several times, only to have the relentless sand engulf him each time. He continued to navigate, seeking shelter once more. The tempest persisted for seven long hours. Once it had finally subsided, there remained nothing discernible to guide his compass. The sandstorm had obliterated every conceivable point of reference. The once familiar landscape was utterly transformed. Prosperi's initial impulse was to run. He had squandered valuable time, and his primary focus remained on completing the race. I hope to at least get in the medals, he says. Nevertheless, he found it peculiar that he had not encountered a single soul. It was 1994, and the event remained relatively obscure at the time. Prosperi had been running mostly in solitude. However, he couldn't help but wonder why he hadn't crossed paths with the walkers who had departed early from the checkpoint or come across any race markers. Climbing a dune in search of signs of life, he found himself still utterly alone. As the evening approached, the unrelenting winds showed no sign of abating. He resumed running, but after a few minutes, it dawned on him that he had veered off the trail. Determined to regain his bearings, he retreated his steps, scouring the desert for the French flags that marked the route. Eventually, darkness descended upon him and he concluded that further expending his energy would serve no purpose. My only thought was that through my stupidity, I had forfeited any chance of winning the race. But I knew that I couldn't be more than a few miles from the trail, and that the rescuers would come searching for me at dawn. So I prepared a camp and lit a small fire to create light. I slipped into my sleeping bag and fell asleep under the stars. But Mr. Properi saw a silver lining in his ordeal at this point and was in awe at the desert at night. It was immediately fascinating. You have this sky that is white with stars that almost suffocates you, he recalls. On the following morning, Prosperi persisted in his run, maintaining his unwavering belief in the race and his identity as a competitor. Unaware that the race organizers had not initiated a search and realizing that his survival hinged on his own efforts, he remained resolute. At one point, the distant sound of a helicopter reached his ears, sparking hope that it had come to rescue him. The helicopter flew at a low altitude, and he could make out the pilot's white helmet. However, to his dismay, the pilot seemed oblivious to his presence. Carrying flares, which were small and slender, akin to a ballpoint pen, Prosperi decided to take matters into his own hands. He fired a flare into the sky, unfurled the Italian flag from his backpack and, overcome with desperation, 
relinquished all self-control. I ran after him, I shouted at him, I called him Paolo, Giovanni, every random name that sprang to mind. But the noise of the engine faded to a hum. Then there was silence, he said. Prosperi gradually transitioned from running to a brisk walk. He found himself engaged in an entirely new challenge, one without a predefined route or a designated finish line. His adversaries in this unexpected contest were slowly revealing themselves. With his supplies mostly consisting of dehydrated food and no water, he faced an arduous test of survival. On the second day of being adrift in the desert, Prosperi's keen eyes spotted a distant object on the horizon. I was convinced it was somebody's home or a holy man's shrine. As he drew nearer, he identified it as a marabout shrine, a deserted tomb dedicated to a revered Muslim religious leader while the shrine didn't offer any immediate rescue prospects, it did provide much needed shade and other resources. Mauro decided to take advantage of this shelter, grateful to finally have a roof over his head. He affixed his Italian flag to the turret of the shrine, and as he settled in, he noticed an unusual sound reminiscent of tiny birds chirping. Upon investigation, he discovered a cluster of tiny bats clinging to the walls. As his food supplies dwindled to nothing, his gnawing hunger drove him to take actions he never believed he would. Prosperi was compelled to scour the surrounding area for anything edible. He resorted to consuming bird eggs, beetles, and even lizards. Matters took a grim turn when he reached a point where he had to resort to killing the bats residing in the shrine, hoping to extract any moisture that cooking their flesh might yield. With determination, he grabbed a handful of bats, squeezing them to death, employing his small knife he decapitated them, stirred their insides, and sucked out whatever sustenance they could offer. This grim routine continued with approximately 20 bats. This way, I ate and drank at the same time, he says. Afterward, he carried the bat remains out of the shrine and buried them. This was an act of respect for the shrine and the bats, and perhaps it felt important to impose a ritual of civilization upon what had just occurred. That's how I am, very ordered in things, and it seemed just to me if I have to kill an animal to live, I will bury the remains, he said. The anti-diarrhea medication he carried in his backpack proved invaluable in preventing further water loss despite his unconventional and limited diet. To quench his thirst, Prosperi resorted to unconventional means such as sucking on damp wipes from his pack, licking morning dew from rocks, and consuming his own urine while it remained relatively clear. In a resourceful move, he also utilized urine for rehydration and cooking his freeze-dried food, as no other water sources were accessible. At the sound of another aircraft, he hurriedly stepped outside to kindle a fire. I made a hole in the sand. I put in all my things, sleeping bag, rucksack. Plastic things make smoke. Unfortunately, as soon as it was lit, another sandstorm hit. I felt so much anger in my body, he recalled. He waited 12 hours inside the Maraboot for the storm to pass, and the next day came to a decision. In Italy, if they don't find the body of the presumed dead, the family doesn't receive a payout. Since he was a policeman, his wife would have been entitled to his state pension. Prosperi decided that the sensible course of action was to cut his veins. If he bled to death in the marabout, his body would be found and the pension paid. Slowly, slowly, I will fall asleep and die, he thought. It sounds like an act of despair, but Prosperi says it was the product of great anger and acuity. He only had a small knife. But Mauro commenced with cutting his veins and waited inside his shelter to die. Prosperi woke the next morning to find that due to extreme dehydration, the blood had clotted almost immediately at his wrists. I thought it is not my moment. I am not to die here. I will head towards the mountains. From that point onward, his determination to survive surged. And he did everything in his power to ensure his survival. He foraged for rodents and serpents in the area, resorting to consuming large ants, chewing on leaves, and modifying his running shoes by cutting the backs to alleviate the sores on his heels. In a last-ditch effort to reach safety, Prosperi departed from the shrine and commenced a journey toward distant mountains. He embarked during the early morning and late evening hours to evade the scorching daytime heat. Along the way, he strategically left fragments of his gear behind as markers, akin to a trail of breadcrumbs. Although he believed these mountains lay along the Marathon's trail, this route inadvertently took him deeper into the vast Sahara. In the profound and desolate silence of the desert, the only companion he had at times was the faint hiss of the wind. 
As he traversed arid riverbeds, he resorted to extracting moisture from plant roots. Then, after enduring eight grueling days in the unforgiving desert, Prosperi stumbled upon a desert oasis. Really, it was only a large puddle, a mirror of water in a wadi. I threw myself upon it and gulped with abandon, but I could hardly swallow. I managed to force a mouthful of it down, and almost immediately I vomited. I couldn't hold anything. I found I had to take tiny sips, one every ten minutes. After satisfying his thirst, Prosperi replenished his water container and resumed his journey. Over time, he came across some desiccated goat excrement and persisted in his search for additional signs. These dung markings eventually guided him to the presence of human footprints. On the ninth day, he spotted something in the distance. Dromedaries, he thought. As he grew closer, he realized they were goats. He was about 200 meters away when he saw that they were being herded by a girl. He had reached a Berber settlement. I understood then that I was reborn. I'd been in the desert nine and a half days. I felt I'd been inside the belly of the desert like a pregnancy. I was born anew. The Berber families gave him goat's milk which he vomited up because it was too much after days of starvation and dehydration. Prosperi had trekked all the way to Algeria, crossing through a border region riddled with landmines. Suspected of being a foreign agent, military police blindfolded him and transported him to a base in Tindu. Later, he was admitted to a hospital where he spent a week in intensive care. Reports indicated that Prosperi shed 35 pounds during his ordeal, weighing a mere 99 pounds when he was ultimately rescued. Medical professionals noted that his liver had nearly completely failed, and he received 16 liters of intravenous fluids from the hospital staff. Upon reuniting with his family and receiving a warm welcome in Italy, Prosperi's recovery proved challenging. He struggled to consume solid food for several months after his harrowing experience and claimed that it took almost two years for him to fully recuperate. Back in his hometown of Rome, he posed for photographs alongside his wife. During this time, a sports journalist who had known him as an Olympian inquired, So, will you run the marathon again? To which Prosperi responded, I always finish my races. True to his word, Prosperi gradually rebuilt his strength over the subsequent two years and made a remarkable comeback to compete in the Marathon des Sables in 1997. Remarkably, he went on to complete the race an additional nine times with his last participation occurring in 2017. Several adventurers and journalists have cast doubt on the veracity of Prosperi's account, given the seemingly extraordinary nature of the feats he described. Some have suggested that he might have either staged or embellished the ordeal for financial gain and publicity. Patrick Bauer, the founder of the Marathon des Sables, even went as far as declaring to Men's Journal that he believed the story was a fabrication and physically implausible. These assertions prompted Prosperi to contemplate legal action against Bauer, although he eventually decided against it, characterizing the dispute as a personal matter rather than a legal one. Nevertheless, the documented physical trauma Prosperi endured was undeniably excruciating and it left lasting effects on his body with a visible scar on his wrist, allegedly from his suicide attempt in the desert. Documentary crews have returned to the Maraboot Shrine and uncovered bat skeletons along with abandoned personal items that substantiated his narrative. The tale of Mauro Prosperi's survival might strain credulity for some. Even according to his own recollection, he made decisions that would have ostensibly diminished his prospects of staying alive. Nonetheless, after enduring nine days in one of the planet's most unforgiving environments, Prosperi managed to eke out a narrow path to safety, an achievement that is undeniably remarkable. Commonly, people associate deserts with death. However, in Mauro Prosperi's case, the opposite held true. He stated, I say to a lot of people, if you really want to understand life, you have to go to the desert. If you have a life that you can't interpret, you become alone. Everything felt amplified. My love of nature, my love of sport, the will to do, the love of life. Surviving in the Sahara Desert demands more than just physical preparedness. It requires a deep reservoir of resilience and adaptability. The desert is a formidable adversary, but it is also a teacher. Respect the sun's searing heat, the biting cold of the night, and the scarcity of water. In every challenge, there is an opportunity to learn, adapt, and grow stronger. In the desert, water is your most precious resource. Conserve it diligently, savor every drop, 
and never underestimate its value. Embrace the wisdom of the desert. Water is life, and life is to be cherished. The desert rewards innovation and resourcefulness. Learn from the nomadic communities that have thrived here for centuries. Discover how to find water sources, build shelter from the elements, and make the most of what the desert offers. In the vast expanse of the Sahara or any desert, it's easy to become disoriented. Hone your navigation skills, whether through the stars, sand dunes, or natural landmarks. The desert becomes less daunting when you can find your way. Your mental resilience is your greatest asset. Cultivate a mindset that thrives on challenge, embraces discomfort, and finds beauty in simplicity. Your thoughts can be a wellspring of strength. In the desert, every mile covered and every drop of water found is a triumph. Celebrate these small victories, for they are the stepping stones to survival and success. The journey through the Sahara is a test of endurance, but it's also a testament to the human spirit's indomitable will. Never lose hope, for within its flicker lies the strength to overcome. In the challenges of desert survival, you'll discover your inner fortitude, and in its vastness, you'll find a profound connection to the beauty and resilience of our natural world. Surviving the Sahara is not just about physical survival, it's a journey of the soul, a testament to the limitless capacity of the human spirit to endure and thrive. Essential tips so you can navigate an outdoor disaster. Thank you for watching. Want more outdoor disaster content? Check out these stories I believe you'll enjoy.